Uh, we will go call the meeting back to order. We actually um, did call the meeting to order at 6 o'clock. We had an executive session, but this is the regular sec session of the August 21st Village Council meeting. Um, it feels like a long time since we've been here. It's been more than a month, so um, welcome everyone. Um, the, uh, let's see, announcements. The first item in the agenda is announcements. I did want to make one uh, brief announcement that there is the James A. McKee Association is uh, sponsoring a community conversation on how to use restorative justice to heal our community. Jalen Rowe and Jennifer Berman will lead the discussion. Um, it's free, open to the public, and it's this Wednesday, August 23rd at 11.30 in room B105 at Antioch University Midwest. Okay. August 25th, what date? Uh, 23rd. The 23rd, so it's this Wednesday. One, this Wednesday. At uh, 7? Uh, 11.30. Oh, 11.30. Yeah, their meetings are 11.30 a.m. to 1 p.m. at AUN. And what was that room again? What is it, B? B105. I guess I didn't enunciate anything or I was going too <laughs> fast or something. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and I think that's a really important meeting to attend. I also wanted to uh, highlight that um, we are having the Complete Streets Workshop um, this Thursday uh, from 8.30 a.m. to 1 p.m. That's going to be in rooms A and B. Uh, that meeting is open to the public. Um, hopefully uh, all council members will be able to attend. We've got a lot of village staff and other interested stakeholders, uh, including the Senior Center, that are going to be there. Um, also, this Sunday, uh, August 27th, uh, Home Inc. is going to be having an ice cream social at the Methodist Church at 2 p.m. And um, I did want to highlight that our next council meeting will be um, Tuesday, September 5th, because September 4th is Labor Day. And I wanted to, while well, we have staff members here and while it's early and everybody's awake, um, Staff would like to speak briefly about um, the water issue, the brown water issue, and I thought doing it during announcements was probably a good time to do it. So I see that, I don't know if Patty's going to start, Brad Alt from uh, the water treatment plant and Johnny Burns of uh, um, electric and water distribution. So who's, who's going to um, start? I will start. Um, and I would like to start by, um, staff worked on a, uh, a flyer that we are going to send out in all of the utility bills that will be coming out the first of the week. And it's got a lot of information in it, so what I would like to do is just to read this, and then we can cover a couple of other topics, so it'll just take a minute. Um, dear Village Resident, as many of you are aware, there have been instances of brown water recently. These events have to do with several factors. First and foremost, the age and condition of our system weighs heavily on this. The current plant removes iron, but not manganese. We are building a new water plant which will remove manganese in addition to iron, which is ahead of schedule and should be operational by the end of the year. However, we are in compliance with all lead and copper requirements and testing after the most recent brown water incident found no lead contamination in any samples. That was a concern for a lot of residents, so we want to make sure that you understand that. However, we will still have the age distribution system to deal with. The accumulation of many years of manganese has coated, coated and settled in the lines. Increased pressure stirs the settlement up and causes brown water. We are working on a plan with the Ohio EPA to systematically replace our distribution system. Several major projects have already been completed, including Limestone Street, the loop completion project, which included Livermore, East North College, and Quarry Street, Cemetery Street, and the bottleneck elimination along Xenia Avenue, to name a few. We are also working with the Ohio Rural Water Association to implement unidirectional hydrant flushing to better clean the lines of accumulated manganese. We want to tell you what you can expect as we move forward. The most recent brown water event was caused by equipment and flow testing, and that testing will increase as the new plant goes online, causing brown water incidents. Also, we will soon begin valve exercising in anticipation of the new unidirectional hydrant flushing, which will also cause brown water incidents. 
Please be aware that this new method will likely produce the brownest water to date as it will be far more effective in removing sediment from the lines. Coordinating the operation of the new plant with the new unidirectional hydrant flushing method should reduce issues moving forward, but it will t still take several years to, of flushing to get the new, with the new unidirectional method before brown water events stop as a regular occurrence. As we approach all testing and flushing activities, we will post a notice on the Village website and the Village Facebook page. Press releases will be sent to the YS News as well. Please watch these locations for the notices so that you can be prepared for a possible brown water event. We will also be developing an instructional piece about what to do when a brown water incident occurs that will be included in your next water bill. We understand that brown water is upsetting, but with our aged system, it is unavoidable until the new plant is operational and the lines have had several years of flushing with the new method. We ask for your patience as we continue to improve the services we provide to you. So now that I've read that, I would like for Johnny and Brad to come up and talk a little bit about, um, Johnny, a little bit about the unidirectional uh, hydrant flushing and then Brad and Johnny together, one of the questions I had was, why do some people get brown water and other people not get brown water? So. Okay, the unidirectional flushing, I'm working with Ohio River Water to create a program. And the first thing is, is we have to start turning valves that's not been turned for a long time. That way, as we get the valves to operate, we can sectionalize parts of town to where it, the massive flow of water does not disturb all of town like it does now. So by being able to shut down certain valves, we can isolate neighborhoods, get them clean, and then the next, and move on forward. Um, the unidirectional flushing is, is by shutting a valve down, you can bring water from one side, close that valve, and then you can bring water from another side. We won't be flushing every hydrant, it's not designed to flush every hydrant. You pick certain hydrants and the Ohio River Water is actually doing that with us. They're actually creating a program. Uh, with them and Brad and myself, we're gonna work with the EPA. They're gonna approve the program. And then we may only flush a couple hydrants in, in each section uh, to start off with to get the massive flow of water going to that area. Um, a lot of people think that you just turn it on and let it run until it's it's cleared up. Um, that does some good, but it does not remove as much as it should by getting the volume going a different way or reversing the flow. That is what releases the manganese that's in the bottom of the pipes. Uh, why do some people have brown water? Others don't. It depends on where your tap for your water is located. So if you have an eight inch line that feeds the plat, if on the bottom, you're at the bottom, your house is fed off the bottom of that pipe, then you're gonna probably get a lot of brown water. But if somebody come off the top of it, it just depends on where they put that, then you're not gonna get as much brown water. Mm -hmm. I know of a couple of houses that one has brown water, one don't. One's taps on the top, one taps on the bottom. So that's the reason why some people get it, some people don't. But going forward, we'll have a much better notification system when yes. there is going to be something that might happen. Yes, we will. But with that being said, uh, one, uh, if we have a fire, everybody can expect brown water through town because we can't notice that. Right. If we have a water main break, it's going to disturb uh, brown water through town. We will do everything possible to make sure that people are notified days in advance. But we do have emergencies and unseen incidents that we cannot control. We just ask for the patients. We're, we're, with the EPA and me was talking the other day with Brad, um, we're at the finish line of this whole process. And we can't jump to the finish line fast enough and we have to finish this final leg which is going to disturb the water <coughs> more frequently. 
And um, what we are trying to do is develop a master schedule of tests and valve exercising that we're going to put the whole schedule out and then each time one of them is coming up we'll then reissue another alert that says you could potentially have that. For instance, tomorrow they're doing a, a filter media at the plant. Brad, why don't you talk a little bit about the filter media? Yeah, yeah right now is the time that Shook is um, kind of they're going from the old plant, they're putting new where we're reusing part of the old plant. So it seems like any day they've got, they've got to do things. They, we try to give notice. Sometimes we don't feel it's going to stir up brown water, but we put it out there just to be safe. Tomorrow they're putting in our new media for our sand. To do that, they have to take water from our main and slurry it and put it in. It should not stir up any brown water. We put out the memo just in case. Um, neither of us foresee it stirring up any brown water, but we just want to let people n know what's going on. And could you just briefly update us on the schedule for the plant? What's the expected completion date? Um, I believe they've got 45 days ahead. Um, I think they're even further than that, but they don't really want to advertise that because anything could happen to slow it down. They don't want to get people's hopes up. Um, but it's coming along good. We're doing training, a lot of tr training uh, at the end of this month and through next month. So a lot of the new processes we're trying out and the reps are coming in to show us how they work. If we stay on schedule, um, and I, I'm not sure exactly when Johnny's flushing is, but we hope to have everything done by the holidays. And by the holidays, I mean before Thanksgiving. Um, I do want to put everyone, and we do not know at this time if this is going to happen or not, but the high-speed pump that we started for three minutes, Brad, <laughs> the other day, we're going to put it into full operation. And so staff got together and we talked about what different times would be the best time to do that, what would be the least disruptive to everyone. Um, and we came up with 9 o'clock on a Friday night. And the reason we came up with that was because everybody's probably settling down for the night, the restaurants and shops are closing, you don't have to get up early in the morning and go to work or school on Saturday. So. It will give a time overnight if we get it running for the sediment to settle back down in the line, which will minimize how much brown water you may or may not have in the morning. But if you do get up on Saturday morning and have brown water, you can flush your lines before you get started for the day. We don't know for sure if that's going to happen this Friday because we're trying to work with the EPA on all of these schedules. And I don't think they got back with you today, Brad. No. So if it is going to happen, we will put out a press release um, either Wednesday or Thursday. Um, and you know, we, my staff would come in, Brad and his staff would be at the plant. Johnny and his staff will be opening some hydrants between the plant and the south end of town to let a lot of that sediment out before it even gets pushed in. Um, so that, that was how we thought would be the best minimal impact on the village residents and businesses. So we will definitely let you know if that's coming right now. The only thing we have for sure is the sand slurry tomorrow, and we hope that's not going to affect anyone, but we did put out a press release just in case. And again, to reiterate, the, the water is not, it, it is safe. It may not be particularly attractive and it may not be something people want to drink but it is safe it's not going to hurt you it's not it's not going to hurt your pets it's not going to it probably will hurt your whites if you do a load of laundry but we do have read out for free no charge at the utility office any comments or questions from council citizens who are here any comments or questions I do appreciate Christine Johnson. I would like to say I do appreciate the calls that came out of the emergency call system. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that kind of boring because I was going, where is this brown stain coming in my toilet? I couldn't figure out yeah. every time I flush it. Yeah. But now I knew, and that really does come back to the And we will, if we do the, if we do the, um, 
if we start the high speed pump and put it into operation, we will do a hyper reach to let everybody know that. That is one of the best ways. We'll do all the other things too, but we will do a hyper reach. Okay. So. Great. Thank you both. Thank you so much. Um, one other announcement item that I forgot was on September 15th, we have the Tecumseh Land Trust um, harvest auction. It's at 6 o'clock. Uh, tickets are uh, $50 by, if you buy them by September 6th, then they're $60 at the door. The village is a sponsor, and as such, we do have two tickets. So, council, we need to decide. I don't think we know that we need to decide it right now, but those two tickets are, are available to council members who might be interested. Um, I, I have that. one announcement. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Uh, some of you may know or, or have heard, but a uh, longtime employee of the village uh, who had retired a couple years ago, uh, Harold uh, Dooney uh, Hamilton, uh, passed away uh, late last week. And uh, we just, uh, I, I just want to, uh, you know, send out our prayers to Bev and the, uh, the family. Uh, Dooney was a very faithful employee of the village for uh, many years, and uh, his passing is going to be a loss to all, all of us. And the service is at the AME, AME Church, Church Wednesday morning at 10 o'clock from 10 to 12. Um, next on the agenda is, the, were there any other, other announcements, Council? Um, Next is the uh, consent agenda. We have the minutes of July 17th, 2017. I think that Judy had a, a correction at our table. Um, I think what you just added that Patty was at the meeting, so that was really the only change to those minutes that Patty was at the meeting. So um, can I have a motion for approval? I move. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Abstain. I wasn't okay. there. Uh, review of the agenda. Um, I know. I mean, it's it's a it's a large agenda. Um, a couple of things. One is um, I have told the folks from Union Schoolhouse that we will give them some extra time during citizens' concerns to present. Um, the information that they uh, received I, from their uh, survey. And also, Krista McGaw is here um, to talk briefly. We'll have, um, if council agrees, legislation at the next meeting um, related to the letter that was in our packet. So um, I've asked Krista to speak briefly um, during the citizens' concerns portion about that. So um, anything else that we want to move or change on the agenda? What about the letter about the tax exempt financing are we going to do we need to talk about that the tax exempt financing uh, there was a sample letter oh oh yeah i mean that that is just something that came from amp has that gone out yet or is that that i mean i think that might be able to be stay in petitions and communications and yeah and just have a motion of council as to whether okay. you'd like to send that and then also uh i just want to say something very briefly about the complete streets okay. piece I guess do you, I mean, did you want new business or whatever. It okay. doesn't matter. Just okay. real and quick. I, I well, just we'll wanted to put it under old since it's okay. Old's fine. Um, suggest I think the only staff item you've got under old business is pocket neighborhoods that you might want to move that forward so that that staff person doesn't stay for the Okay. So place. move the pocket neighborhood um, to the to the front of the pack and under old business, okay? Anything else? Down. Anything else on the agenda that we want to change or move around? Okay. Um, would you want to review the petitions and communications, Brian? Yes. Um, so we received a, uh, a short message from Carmen Milano and um, Bronwyn uh, Reese uh, in support of the lodging tax. Um, we also received an email from Aveta Jasova. 
sorry if I didn't pronounce that name correctly, about uh, noise at Gaunt Park. Uh, specifically, it was in reference to um, a event that happened on July 28th, um, and uh, she was suggesting that we should not uh, rent out the facility late at night. Um, I, I think, was that a picture of the solar array? Uh, there at the end of the packet? Yeah, it is. Okay, yeah. So we had a picture of the solar array and uh, its progress on Glass Farm. Or the I thought structure that was, of the solar array. <laughs> right, well, yeah, how it's, how it's progressing. So I thought that was kind of cool. Um, uh, also, Green County Public Health uh, did mention that their latest testing of mosquitoes did find that there is West Nile virus, which we've had in Green County before, and they have some precautionary measures on what you should do to avoid that. Uh, we mentioned Krista's letter, which we're going to talk about, uh, I guess, uh, under concerns. citizens' concerns. Uh, the Treasurer's report, which showed uh, that we're doing a little bit better with uh, earnings on what we invest. Uh, we can't uh, earn a lot based on the limitations that we have, but uh, but it's looking a lot better. Part of that was due to uh, increase in percentage with our Star Plus uh, account. Uh, the mayor's monthly report showing typical activity compared to last year, and um, then. I guess I, I saved last this uh, letter to state electeds, uh, which is about uh, the importance of tax exempt bonds for uh, local governments. And so I think the idea was that this was a letter that um, AMP was encouraging us to send and support. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. And it's basically a pro forma letter that they sent. So, I mean, I would just ask if their council would have a motion um, to approve me signing and sending that letter. I move. Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you. Um, so that's, you've got through it. I think that's all of them. Okay. Um, moving on to public hearings and legislation. Uh, resolution 2017-39, we'll read that in by title. All right, this is accepting the annexation of 1.713 acres of land, more or less, from Miami Township, Green County, Ohio, to the village of Yellow Springs, Ohio. Can I get a motion, please? So move. Second. Okay. Um, Patty. Or uh, I can take it. And Denise, would you like to take it, or you want me to? The Gust Gustafson an annexation. Denise has worked quite hard on this, so. Well, this is for the annexation part. Mm -hmm. The Planning Commission at their last meeting um, did make a recommendation for the rezoning. Um, <clears throat> this property is part of a... Uh, larger um, section in the northwest uh, part of Yellow Springs that is completely surrounded by the village. So um, this, uh, this annexation doesn't expand our borders in any way. Um, and this is uh, at the request of the, um, the uh, owner who wants to come and be actually in the village of Yellow Springs. And uh, the Planning Commission sees no, no issues with it at all. Um, because the property will come in in our um, uh, code as residential A, uh, we then have to have it rezoned. And so Planning Commission is making that recommendation to you for your next meeting when you will then rezone it to residential B, which is what everything else is along North High Street. I just wanted to point out because there, I I have seen some questions. I think there has been a little bit of confusion about annexation because council has has been um, somewhat reticent to, to annex property, and it so the, we're talking about the red parcel mm -hmm. outlined in right. red. Mm -hmm. And I think what's important to note is that um, on along uh, High Street and then along Fairfield is that is that on Fairfield. Uh, it doesn't. It doesn't hit Fairfield. It's actually. Right. Right. But all of all yes. of those yes. lots mm -hmm. around it yes. are North in the village of Yellow Springs. Yes. So this is essentially yeah. a piece of property, five acres total, within the vill with within all totally surrounded by right. annexed village property that is still in the township. This partial section of 1.7 acres is being asked to be annexed. Right. It's sandwiched between King Street and North High, Dayton, and uh, Fairfield. So it's completely surrounded by the village. Thank you. And this particular 
this particular legislation relates to um, us accepting it and being willing to provide services to that parcel of property, which we've agreed to. Um, and it was approved, it was put forward by Green County Commissioners, so the Green County Commissioners have voted and approved this um, annexation. Um, any comments or questions from Council? Well, I, I support this. I wanted to ask Council to, on future agenda soon, to consider, um, I happen to be at that planning commission because Jerry wasn't able to make it when they discussed this. And um, you know, it was mentioned that the default for annexation is residence A, which is our least uh, dense residential district. And I said to the chair of planning commission, Matt, um, you know, why, would, why is that our, our uh, default? And he said, good question. <laughs> Maybe you council need to decide to change that. And I would like us to consider changing that. And in fact, you know, at least to residence B, um, because that was one of the incongruities during our when our new zoning code was written that it was that we were going for density, increased density, but then we have this default of A, which is the least dense. So anyway, I would like. Well, uh, what I would suggest is that go to Denise as our as our. And just that that's council's wishes. I mean, would you need to bring forward the, the language, the zoning code language? I, I, I can look at that with my efficiency. Yeah, that'd be fine. And, uh, and I'll, I'll need to talk to legal because I think in some cases, you know, it's pretty clear uh, that it could be come in with this zoning that's around it. And I'm not sure that the zoning that's around it, but there might be areas where it might not be so clear, and then you'd still want to have some sort of default. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I would like us to consider defaulting to at least residence B anywhere in the village. Um, and uh, because, like I say, I don't think it's congruous with our aims, uh, with the village aims. So I'd like, you know, it would be good to hear from Planning Commission and look at that. Yeah, I mean, if there are any pros or cons to that, I guess cons in particular to that change, but I have the same question too, is why is that the default? Because it, it causes another step also in the process, right. and it's counter to generally our goals. So Although, I mean, regression. what seems more logical to me is that it would default to whatever the surrounding, whatever the neighboring zoning is, rather than say that it come in a, at a particular zone. <laughs> which was um, the example that I gave at the Planning Commission meeting because uh, when you annex Glen Helen, I mean, technically that came in as residential A, but it's conservation, so there was another step that they had to go through. Mm -hmm. And if we could have it go be match the area, and then if it's maybe then up in the air where, what it should be, then, you know, if you're suggesting residence B. As and why do we need a default at all? Because there might be places where you just don't know what you want to do with it, mm. you know? Okay. It could be a large property and you're not really sure you're going to do some sort of business development on it, you're going to do residential. Mm -hmm. I think it's good to at least have some default. Okay. Okay, um, so back to the issue of this specific annexation. Um, comments or questions from council? Comments or questions from citizens? Seeing and hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, next piece of legislation is a resolution 2017-40, title only please. Yes, this is authorizing the village manager to enter into an agreement between the Village of Yellow Springs and Heinz Engineering LLC for professional engineering services. Uh, can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. Okay. Um, Patty? Yes. Uh, this is part of the um, medical marijuana, as council will recall. Um, the village is going to own this infrastructure. We're not going to pay to put it in. Uh, Cresco Labs, if they're awarded the license, is going to pay to put this in. But we will own it and we will have to apply for certain EPA permits uh, for the water and the sewer. So we agreed in the beginning to do the engineering for it to make sure that it was to our standards and to our specifications. This is the contract and the quote is uh, attached as an exhibit from Mike Heinz, who is thoroughly familiar with that property. He's done a survey on it. He designed the infrastructure that is currently going in along Dayton Yellow Springs Road that will immediately connect to this infrastructure. Um, and 
So that is why he is being recommended for this. Um, my, this is above my spending limit, which is why it's coming before council um, for council to approve this contract. And I would like to say that um, there was a meeting last week of a number of village staff members, um, myself, uh, Chris Connor, um, and the contractors uh, that, that uh, Cresco has hired, their architects, um, and also a couple of folks from Cresco. Mm -hmm. So um, it was a great meeting. We went through, you know, looking at the site plan and um, talking about the work that needed to be done. And everybody's optimistic. It looks like the state is maybe pushing back um, their decision making on the licensing to, to, it had been September to October, and now they're talking October, November. So um, I think that they received a lot more um, proposals than they expected, and the proposals were more extensive. Uh, Cresco, for example, I think submitted a 700 plus page proposal. So um, I think the state has more, um, the Department of Commerce has more work to do than they expected. It was 7, Seven thousand. Seven thousand. Oh gosh. Okay. Yes. So, yes. Um, so I was I was short a little, but um, <laughs> so yeah. So so the whole issue here is that is that they don't know when they're going to find out about the licensing, but the state still has dates of when they need to be up and operational, and that date is September eighth. So they are going to want to be moving very quickly and they want everything in place when they get the license to, um, to be able to move forward. Um, this will allow them to, um, this, well, we, we won't start construction. This we will, will simply not. allow, this will simply do the design work. Correct. And um, then when they have a lot of this design work done, they will also then be able to go to meet with the uh, uh, building department for Green County, start to get the building um, details um, and, and construction methodologies uh, firmed up with them. So they're really being proactive about wanting to be ready to hit the ground running and get construction started when they get the positive news about their license. Um, I'm not clear though. Are we saying we're going to spend $48,000 when we don't really know whether they're going to get their, get the approval? Yes. Hmm. I will say that the um, that the design that we're talking about with cre with this particular layout is is very similar to what was there before, but um, it's it's not exactly what was there before as far as laying it out. Cresco is buying the northwest corner of the property. Um, and so the road will run to their property um, as, a, as well as all the infrastructure, but it will not, but it will not connect to the other lots because we don't know. We don't want, there'll be. I want to explain this correctly. There'll be the opportunity for taps on other lots, but we don't know where the other lots will be. So. It won't be specific. I, I think I missed something too. Did you say that? I mean, the state has moved back their decision till October or November, but they're asking people to have what done by September. By they, se they are supposed to be ready to sell by September of 2018. They're supposed to have product grown and processed and ready oh, to oh, sell. Oh. Why? Is that state required? That's the yes. state. One. Yeah. That's the state. They're paying, they're paying us for, uh, I forget what it's called, for their option to buy. Yes. They're, they're paying us $20,000. $20, so that if they don't end up getting the, we're going to get that $20,000. correct. Uh, help to, yeah. okay. RFC contracting, that is who is they've selected to do the construction? Yes. So when Mike Heinz, if we approve this, Mike Heinz is going to be basing the costs on what what they no my clients will be doing the engineering to our specifications and based it on what myself and my staff have told him will be our requirements so and well, what about this an engineer's estimate of construction costs so because i know we've talked about um 
depending on whether Cresco or the village does it. Um, so is that engineer's estimate going to be based on RFC contracting or? Um, it, the engineer's estimate uh, will be based on what Mike developed, excuse, excuse me, on what Mike develops it at to be built by a private contractor, okay. which is what, it's Roger Riachi's company. Right. Okay. Um, are we applying the uh, dig once policy to this project? We are applying the dig once policy. However, Johnny was contacting Thor to see what the best way to get the conduit in for the fiber was, and I don't know if he's heard back. So, um, because we're not sure if the conduit should run along with this infrastructure or along with the electric infrastructure. And we're not sure if it should come in off of East Enid or off of Daniel Springs, and that's what we're trying to get from Thor. Okay. What the best way to do that is. And if um, they're not successful, is this going to be useful to us or not? I believe so. It's yeah. it's as Patty said. It's really very close to um, what Jacobs Engineering had done, and then what Mike revised um, under under. Um, uh, Laura Curlis's, Curlis's direction to, to reduce the scope of the project. So it essentially goes in at the, at the turn lane where that infrastructure now will end. It essentially goes straight in and then and then curves over to that back lot. From Dayton Street? From Dayton yes. Street, yes. It, Marianne, I, I think that the design, the general design that we spoke about in our meeting will allow us to make the best use of that property because of the way that the layout will be with with the road curving to the left and also going back out to East Eden, um, it will allow us to have the best the best use of that property. And and part of what Mike will be doing related to the platting will also allow us to um, be closer to, the, to, to be able to do lot splits and things for potential other development or sale of lots within that, within the CBE. Right. I mean, we're going to replat it as one parcel belonging to Cresco and two large parcels belonging to the village. And, and one other question. Is this the engineering for coming off of Dayton Street and then going to East Enon or just? Yes, it will come off of Dayton Street, go up and go out to East Enon, but it will also curve to the left to meet the back side of, of Cresco's lot okay. where their parking will be. Any other questions, questions or comments from citizens? Chrissy? Um, maybe I'm confused, but this seems to go against the referendum on paying for the infrastructure of the CBE property. We said that um, the village was not going to be held responsible for that infrastructure, and I'm thrilled to death about Cresco Corporation coming here and setting up, but my understanding after talking to them and sitting through the meetings was that they intended to pay for everything themselves. If this infrastructure, $48,000, has to be done only for Cresco, because face it, we have no other people wanting to settle in over there, then it seems to me that that should be their cost, not ours. They should find a way to build a road in there. They said they were willing to cover all the expenses. I just feel like this completely is a end run around the referendum against having the village pay for infrastructure on the CBE. And we already did that with this parcel that we had to do the infrastructure on in order to get the money back from the um, Corps of Engineers. Um, I just, I didn't realize that this was something that the village was going to be paying for $48,000 when we said no. We said no, we did not want to pay for the infrastructure on that property. We voted on it and it was said no. And then here we are once again paying for the infrastructure on the property. Maybe it's not as much, it's not a, a million dollars this time, but it's 50000 almost and then what's going to come up next? And it's just going to be, you know, I get this feeling before this whole thing is over with, we're going to have put in all that money anyways because you're going to piece it out of us a little bit at a time like this. I, I don't think this is the right thing to do. I think the village, if, if when we're, yeah, uh, proposals like this, which if, if it goes through is going to be a huge asset to the village, um, the village has to do, it has to do an independent 
uh, has to have an independent engineering to protect us. And uh, it has to be independent, which means we pay for it. But they're paying us uh, just for holding the land. They're going to pay us $20,000 if it doesn't go through. And that will help defray half of that almost, or right. you know, $20,000 of and it. But I, I think of property, I mean, the money, if, if the deal goes through. Well, if the deal goes get, through, yes. Right. But I'm just saying there is some cost that we're going to have to bear. Uh, in order to protect our own interests, that's the way I look at it. We, we did Does that agree. Make sense? We did agree in the beginning to pay for the engineering for that very reason, because yeah. it has the road has to be built to our specs, not just to carry their traffic, and the infrastructure has to be built to not just carry their water and wastewater, but all of the water and wastewater for potential development on the entire. But they're putting the infrastructure in. They're yes. paying for yes. all of the so, infrastructure. That so they're putting the infrastructure in. I, I mean, I think we have to be realistic. And like I say, to have an independent analysis that protects us, um, if, it's gonna, if, if, we, if we're not paying for it, then it's no longer I, as independent. I guess I maybe you could say it's like we're having oversight over what they're going to do. And if we're going to have oversight, then we have There's to some pay for that. that we have to. So this isn't actually for the infrastructure itself. Though it does give me pause to pay for something, and then we don't know if we're going to use it or not. Right. Clearly. But, it, but it does give us, I mean, it really, it, it, I, I see very few other ways to get that road in there. So I think that, that whether it's for this particular project or for another project, this engineering will get us far, um, will take us farther than we were before. And, and it will give us information that we need to move forward. And again, we need to hold the EPA permits. We're going to own the infrastructure, so we need to hold the EPA permits, and we can't use their engineering to, to hold the EPA permits. It's just kind of a, it's a, yeah. a necessary expense if we want them to consider coming here. That's my right. understanding of it. Any other? Oh. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think where to start on this. It's, um, part of it may relate to uh, the question that Chrissy asked in the presentation, Patty, that you, uh, or characterization that you made um, uh, about what's being planned right now. It's my, my initial impression reading it in the packet uh, and hearing the, the uh, initial introduction is that it's a fairly uh, extensive engineering fee and it's kind of part of it's explained uh, as you guys talk about it it's essentially engineering for the whole site yes. and, and I wonder why at this point with a hypothetical client uh, that some people have, have spoken highly about but certainly it's not a sure thing yet uh, one would be committing to lock in uh, a plan for the whole site um, and even if for instance one were trying to uh, find the basic equipment or basic accommodation that Cresco needs to be able to operate their business. They essentially need a driveway to their site. They do not need two roads that encompass the entire uh, site and lock it in for a certain sort of development plan. And that's the thing that would concern me, that this locks in uh, a great deal of what the village is going to be able to do in the future with that site if one builds or plans to build a series of roads that encompass the whole site for one potential client. Mm -hmm. And it's one potential client who's not approved yet. Um, so that, that would be the concern. I mean, I, it's some sort of minimal accommodation makes sense to keep their proposal going. And it's, uh, it strikes me that it should be really specific to their proposal uh, for what, it, what they need uh, to make their proposal viable if the village and the village has gotten behind that and talked about uh, trying to accommodate their coming to Yellow Springs. But uh, this seems to potentially reach forward a bit too much and maybe make some decisions for the village that uh, we could regret um, uh, on its own face. But certainly, uh, if Cresco doesn't work out, if things change, it's, it's um, a, a good bit of uh, time and commitment, time and resources and commitment that would be uh, potentially heading down the wrong path. Um, so I, I guess in those regards, I wonder if there's a more basic or preliminary uh, arrangement that could be made. Uh, incidentally, I suspect if the state is pushing back its approval timeline, it's also going to push back its production timeline. Uh, I can't imagine that you uh, that the state would just move one set of um, you know 
goalposts or, or, or timelines and, and not the other. But uh, I, I, I guess the thing I was getting is that time is of the essence for the client here. Um, but there still could be a more basic way, it seems to me, for the village to accommodate them in good faith to be their partner in the proposal and see what happens without necessarily planning the whole thing. Um, Dan, you make some good points, but um, the two entrances and exits were something that the village wanted because it keeps the traffic flow going. We're not sure what exactly the traffic flow will be for them. We think it's going to be about 40 cars a day to start, um, but you always want two entrances and exits to a site. Um, the layout that was planned gives the maximum access to all parts of the site. Um, we did meet with a planner, a, a certified planner, um, Ken LeBlanc from Greene County Regional Planning to try to lay this out in the best way possible to utilize the site for, you know, maximum use. And, you know, Cresco is building this on, you know, they're paying to build this. So I guess my question would be if they're willing to allow us to take advantage of that, then why would we not want to take advantage of them building the entire infrastructure to support the site? Mm -hmm. They're paying for all that infrastructure. Yes. Mm -hmm. Are we ready to take a vote, Council? Yep. Okay. Well, I, I, I guess I would just like to, I've said something, mm -hmm. Jerry, Brian, I'd just like to hear from the rest of Council, where, where are you? Uh, I'm, I'm ready to take a vote. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say, I mean, I think you make a good point. And now that you kind of elaborated, I think when Chrissy was talking, I wasn't first. Uh, so I think it's a good point. But that's it. That, so, that, so that's the issue, is that they will then pay for all that infrastructure that could, that could service. But it does, it does um, tie us in to a particular configuration. Right. Um, yeah, and for me, um, I have the same pause. Marianne that you uh, raised about this um, but I guess I, I, two things one is I do think it's important that uh, the infrastructure is built to our specs and um, at the end of the day I mean we the value that we're going to get out of this um, I'm confident in so um, that's going to affect my decision and, and I do believe that ultimately I, I'm very positive for the outcome with Cresco, but ultimately I do believe that this is a, these are plans that we will have, whether that particular, and that will be the best, um, the best option, I mean, to, for, for, for development of that property. So I don't believe it's going to be wasted work. Um, okay, ready to take the vote. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Um, next item on the agenda is uh, Ordinance 2017-14, imposing a lodging tax. Um, I am going to recuse myself, but I'm actually going to go sit um, in the audience to uh, reserve my right to speak as a citizen. And I'm doing the same. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, so uh, I guess the first thing that I would like to uh, try to do just in terms of we spent a lot of time on this issue. It's been discussed for several meetings. And um, you know, as council thinks more about uh, you know, just sort of getting through a, a pretty hefty agenda, um, we're going to try to cap this discussion at around 20 minutes. It doesn't mean that if there are still comments that citizens need to make that we will not hear them. But um, I guess I would, you know, in particular for Chris and, and Melissa and some of our staff that are going to um, tee this up, emphasize that. Um, so uh, I will just say at the outset that um, where we have come to, and there's plenty of documentation in the packet. Brian, before you do yes. this, do we need to make a motion to get it on the table? For the um, sure. Why don't we do that? Okay. Um, yeah, so Judy, go ahead. This is uh, Ordinance 2017-14, and enacts a new Chapter 882 entitled Lodging Excise Tax of the Codified Ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, effective January 1, 2018. Okay. Uh, to entertain so, a motion? So move. Second. Okay. Um, so uh, just briefly, uh, where we've come to with this issue is uh, 
Um, there are very few uh, kinds of revenue sources that uh, villages or municipalities can um, raise. A lodging tax is one of those. Um, one of the things that we've learned in the process is that there is not a limitation as there used to be pre-2001 um, on five plus rooms. And so uh, the proposal, and, and Chris will talk more about this, is that we levy this tax on all lodging for transient guests. Transient guests are defined um, under state law as staying for 30 days or less. Uh, the other piece that um, Patty has articulated is the uh, expenses that come with being a destination town and the fact that there are community enhancements that not only benefit our residents but also make Yellow Springs an attractive place to visit. So um, I think there's been a lot of uh, careful consideration about this issue, a lot of things that have come up as we've sort of analyzed how different municipalities uh, do this. And um, uh, at this point, over 80% of the municipalities in Ohio do have a lodging tax. Um, I think most of us, it's a very common um, thing to see when we do stay at a lodging uh, in any particular place to see those various taxes being levied. So with that, I'm going to let Chris talk a little bit about sort of uh, where we've come from and, and what the uh, legislation here that we're proposing is. Thank you. I've tried to truncate my comments to accommodate the, uh, the, the time uh, that we want to spend in discussion, perhaps. Uh, in preparing the ordinances before council today, uh, village staff and Jessica Brockman and I reviewed the Ohio Revised Code, local ordinances from Fairborn, Beaver Creek, Cleveland, Fulton, and Hawking County. Uh, the proposed ordinances before council and citizens tonight were also reviewed uh, extensively by staff and, and me, uh, almost line by line. Uh, before the re and we've made revisions, but that is what you see today in the packet. We did our best to anticipate and address concerns of all stakeholders within the village, operators, citizens, village staff, village council, and those who visit the village uh, to design a process that was fair and user friendly. For example, uh, we learned today that there, uh, there's a requirement as we've drafted that there's um, a line item in a bill. We've learned that that may not be possible uh, through an Airbnb invoice. Uh, we are looking into how to address that issue in our code by likely putting in a limitation language. We fully expect that there will be some questions and concerns that may be raised tonight or in days ahead. If you believe there is a potential issue with the ordinances, please contact our finance director, Melissa Dodd, or Denise Swinger, or our zoning administrator. This is the first reading of the ordinances, and there is time to make necessary changes. In addition, in the draft of the codified ordinances that are before council today, we included a section identified as 882.17, which authorizes the finance director to promulgate or or issue additional written rules and regulation to assist in the administration and enforcement of the code. Lastly, this is why the tax, if passed, will not take effect until January 1st, 2018. During this process, staff will be preparing an FAQ and will meet with operators to address concerns as raised. The goal is to, again, implement the code as seamlessly as possible. A few key parts of the code, I think, uh, merit being highlighted. First, as Brian's indicated, the transient guest lodging tax applies only to stays of 30 days or less. Taxes would be paid every six months beginning on July 31st, 2018, but in situations the finance director has the ability to modify those requests either independently or by request of the operator. One of the critical aspects of these proposed changes is in the impact that it would have on the zoning code. Currently the zoning code um, has a provisions that uh, deal with a short-term rental. Our zoning code definition is not consistent with the principles of a transient guest lodging tax because we know transient guest lodging is 30 days or less. Our definition in the zoning code of short-term rental uh, is a rental uh, to a person, family, or entity on a weekly or monthly basis, but typically less than one year. That's not what the lodging tax is assigned to uh, address. So in the discussion with, with staff uh, and uh, with some 
guidance from council and public sessions. Uh, the goal that we had in looking at the zoning code was to try not to make any substantive changes. We want consistency throughout the document. So in order for there to be uh, no conflict, we have to go back and make some text amendments to the zoning code to make sure that the definition of short-term rental is removed from the zoning code and substituted by short-term lodge, or pardon me, uh, transient lodging. Uh, we have drafted uh, some changes. Staff and I are currently reviewing the zoning code. Uh, the zoning code uh, text changes then would need to go to the Planning Commission for consideration, but I think in the context of this is something that Council ought to look at uh, at the next meeting. Uh, and we uh, expect to have that uh, available uh, well before the packet is due. Uh, the last piece uh, that I think everyone needs to understand for this process is that under the current zoning code, short-term rental was a conditional use. Um, the intention would be, in the drafts that we are reviewing, is that a lodging tax uh, would also be a conditional use and uh, currently there are no con standards to judge those conditions. So we are in the process of uh, weighing different conditions to insert into the zoning code so that there would be guidance for both planning commission and the zoning administrator to consider in issuing the permit. Um, again, we expect all of those proposed amendments uh, to the, when I say proposed, but the drafted amendments uh, will be uh, available to uh, citizens and council uh, for discussion at the September 5th meeting. Chris, could you maybe explain a little bit more in depth the, the Airbnb issue, just so everybody's sure. aware what we're talking about there? As I understand it, when, um, since I think I presume most people have stayed at a hotel before, when you receive your bill that they slide under the door, there's a line items of what the various components are that comprise your bill, which includes what the local uh, lodging tax is. I might add, um, some counties have higher lodging taxes, which they've been authorized by state. So I recently stayed in Columbus. They have a 10% lodging tax. We're only looking at a 3% here uh, that the village would pass. Um, so the, the, apparently the issue is in the context of how an Airbnb transaction is conducted, uh, the, uh, the visitor, the guest, pays Airbnb directly and then that generates a payment from Airbnb less its fee. Since Airbnb controls the invoicing process, it's not clear to us that Airbnb would able to be the, put in that light item for what the exact tax was. So if that's the case, then we would have to make a change to this, which would be a procedural one to this proposed draft. So it's quite possible that operators uh, may see some other anomalies based upon their business practices, and that's what we want to try and address on the front end, both either if it has to change the ordinance or if it impacts a proposed or potential rule that the finance director might make as this is rolled out in anticipation of a January 1st implementation date. So to that point in particular, did we follow up with Ottawa County about how they uh, account for their Airbnbs? We did not because we just found that out. Okay. I would, so I, I would I suggest we not get into that okay. since we've got a limited time that we want to try to keep this discussion to and that's something that we're going to be inquiring into and not get into a lot but, of But I want, I want this, everyone right to now. know that there are, we're aware that there will be some things that need to be addressed and so that was a good example of it. Okay. okay. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, Chris. Yeah. Uh, council, any questions at this point? Okay, so I think we'll open it up for uh, citizen comments. Uh, do we have any? Yes. Should we bring the... I'm sorry. Y yeah, can we... And these are citizen comments on this topic? On this topic. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, so any uh, comments about uh, this issue? All right, Jim. Jim Hammond, uh, Mills Park Hotel. Uh, I was reading Brian's letter here. It mentions uh, <clears throat> lodging taxes apply to all local establishments. The uh, Springs Motel is not in the village, but I would consider that local. So there, it's not exactly accurate. And there's, you know, a few other lodging establishments in the township that are local that wouldn't be affected by this. Um, the second thing. Um, if the village does not impose this tax, the, I understand the county has to return 
up to 33% of the county tax collected. Um, but we haven't heard what that number would be. Do we? So I, I would like to know how much Green County would return if we decide not to impose this tax. Do you have any Thanks. Idea? Um, we can answer that right now, Melissa. Yeah, the, the county did pass a uh, resolution at one of their um, more recent meetings that I was in attendance for, and they will be returning 1% of the 3% collected, and the first payment would be given to the village in 2018 based on 2017 receipts. So what that total number would be on an annual basis, I'm not sure yet. I don't have any figures, but it would be 1% of the 3% that they receive. Is it 1% or 0.5%? I, I point. Well, it's they, they get a 3% tax and they're they're giving, I'm sorry, it is 0.5%. You're right, it's 0.5%. It's not a full 1%, it's 0.5%. Okay. My error. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? Okay. I guess I just want more clarity on the Airbnb and as if if the that the intent is to impose the tax on Airbnb establishments because I do know that Airbnb does not allow they do not have a, a, a methodology for collecting it and they actually say in their in their um, contract that if you if there is a local lodging tax you have to collect it but you have to do it separately so I would, I would just want to be assured, reassured that all of the Airbnbs would be um, included in that if, and, and that there isn't an intent here because they don't have the mechanism to do it easily, that they would be exempted somehow. Well, I, no, I think, in fact, the, the person that I spoke to about that, this today said that um, what they would potentially do is take the amount that they charge now, add the 3% to it, and just advertise for that new amount so that I don't think there was any exemption you mean that's what the owner would do yes on the mm -hmm. yeah. well the intention that was, that was one remedy I, there may be other remedies that we haven't thought of mm -hmm. the intention of the legislation is to cover Airbnbs <coughs> because those are transient guests in the village okay. Marianne? I support this tax and I'm glad that the village is reaching out to non-traditional uh, providers such as myself. I do wish that um, whoever worked on this had looked into Airbnb before I made the call today because this is my concern that legislation gets passed. I think it should be done, the investigation should be done thoroughly before legislation comes to council but I do support this and as I said I'm happy that everything's being included I just came back from a trip I was in Niles Ohio I was told the cost of the motel was $104 and I paid 119 was I surprised no I wasn't surprised but I paid what $15 over what the advertised cost was online because that's what how it is that's what you expect thanks any other comments? Okay. Council? I'm for this. <coughs> Jerry? Uh, the question that concerns Airbnb, uh, will we have that answer by when? Well, I mean, I'll, here's what I'm going to say about Airbnb. I mean, we know because I did the due diligence that Ottawa County also includes Airbnbs. So this is a process issue, not a legal okay. issue. Mm -hmm. Just want to say, you know, we had uh, been, thought we had everything in place and we had promised the citizens we were going to bring it back at this meeting and we did not want to delay that. Um, but we know there's some little, de some details that still need to be worked out. It's not going into effect till January. There's time to work those details out. I'm yeah. confident. And I also want to say I, I really appreciate um, you know uh, what I understand the uh, village team's efforts are going to be in terms of education. The one issue that I've heard uh, from my research is that uh, most of the time, if people aren't paying the taxes because they're not aware that it's been levied, and so we're going to borrow best practices to do this. We're not going to add a lot of capacity in that regard, and um, 
We're going to do it fair across the board. And I think at the end of the day, what's you know what's really kind of balanced this whole decision, um, at least for me, is you know number one that we can assess it across the board, so we're not um, singling out any particular uh, lodging establishments. And secondly, how important it is for our village to be able to uh, do the kinds of community improvements and support the sorts of events that make this a great place to visit and uh, and you know both satisfy villagers and visitors. So um, so that's where I'm. Okay. Uh, so with that, uh, I will entertain a motion. To we already made the motion. Okay. Yep. So. Are you ready uh, for me to read? Yes. That? Yes. So please uh, read that in. Yes. Sims. Yes. Humphling. Yes. Housh. Yes. You going back? <laughs> Are you going to walk with you now? <laughs> Feel more comfortable back there? Okay, thank you. Um, so next item on the agenda is citizens concerns and that is to hear from citizens about items that are not on the agenda and um, uh, we ask that you come up to the microphone and um, state your name and keep your remarks to three minutes although I have already said that we have two topics that we will be discussing here that uh, will get more than three minutes so we'll start out with the union the folks from Union Schoolhouse um, I'm not sure who the spokesperson is oh sure okay even though my new Greek has all kinds of lights on it, I get a little nervous about driving in the dark. And we're going to lose our sunlight more than once today, huh? So uh, my name is Christine Johnson. I live at 525 Dayton Street. Uh, I have some handouts enough that you can share. So there's some that people can share here too. Um, I live at 525 Dayton Street, as I was saying, and uh, part of my concern is that I'm up early taking weeds out of my garden, so I hear a six o'clock rumble, rumble, uh, going through the village, one after another, and I watch trucks. There's no way that they're paying attention to the little sign outside of my house that says, reduce speed ahead. They come through, uh, they being like, cement trucks, uh, quarry trucks full of stone, very heavy semis coming through. They come through in no way ready to slow down to 25 miles an hour from my house, 525, to when they reach North High Street. I don't know if you have a map you want it so that people can see what I'm talking about, but those big trucks, there's no way they're they're slowing down and off. And the next block is Stafford Street. At that street, there are four crosswalks that manage, that are marked, and they're supposed to be for people to cross to be able to get to the um, Mills Lawn, the home. Um, when I hear those semis coming, that's one thing, but I also, when I encounter a group uh, motorcycle people coming down all done as a pack together there's no way they're ready to stop at that parking uh, park that was crosswalks I've had to like um, hell, uh, hold my breath get as small as I can there's no way I have time to go backwards there's no way I can have time to go forwards I have my little uh, flag that I carry around with me and so I'm announced to everybody, I'm here in the crosswalk, pay attention. So and I nod when they when they stop for me, I say, Well thank you, thank you. I I I've been in this this wheelchair business for fifteen years or sixteen years and so I'm very familiar of what a hassle it is that you guys have to contend with that. Um, there are some sidewalks I can't even get down. We won't talk about that. That's a whole other issue. That's why I have this rig now, because I can actually get on sidewalks without re-injuring my back three times. And they've, 
living here has destroyed it, just getting down some of the uneven sidewalks. But on Dayton Street, those particular sidewalks are not just me, that's anybody else that's coming there. Where I'm living now at 525 is also, I get gathered by watching you guys on Monday, I think that, I think I understood correctly, that's also where you're, um, where you're looking at uh, the start of uh, a downtown district. You have little markers uh, set in to the, um, like they have in Xenia Avenue, where people say, no, slide, slow down, you know, this, this is a community. So I have uh, broken down, um, I wanted to conduct, con the, the uh, mention, the um, high street difficulty, um, there's, and the fact that there's a speed coming through, and then also the uh, trucks that are coming through are very heavy trucks. They're carrying cement mixers, the kind that have the cement dissipation that comes in three different segments and they let it through. There's no way that they're coming by my house at 35 miles an hour and in a block, we have to get in front of Don Beard's house on that corner of North High and Dayton Street and be able to be at 25 miles an hour. There's no way they can do that. They can't. And so I, I requested in recommendations here that we take a look at mostly to find out if we have some limitations about the size, the weight that are uh, indicated for Dayton Street. Um, I, I make a rather snide remark in, in here. It says, I hear that Dayton Street has a history of repairs due to water pipes breaking. This might be the cause. <laughs> you know, because we get a lot of weight coming through. Um, it also, I think it would be important to try and do a radar test. Because I understand that, as the, when it goes through Enon, they're at what, 45 or 55? 35. Huh? 35 at Enon. Yeah. And so I was wondering, can we do somewhere where they get to 25? I think, you know, I think Chief is right. Chief's paying a lot of attention to you. And, <laughs> and you know, I that's what I was going to suggest, that we turn this over to Chief um, and, and ask him to maybe come to the next meeting with a little bit of a report. Um, I know that that has been an ongoing, the speed of the cars on Dayton Street has been an ongoing discussion on, on Facebook, um, very similar to the, to the frustration you're, you're expressing. Um, there, there is some discussion going on um, with um, the Active Transportation Committee about adding some crosswalk lights. So that's ongoing with the village. Um, and I, you know, I would potentially look at, at the, the, whether we even need that 35, a, a, quicker, a quicker down to 25. And, and I mean, we don't need to talk about it. I mean, maybe come back and, and, and report to us, but... And the, the tr talk on the phone? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Did okay. you see the reduced one I added at Limestone? No. I added a reduced speed ahead right at Limestone on Dayton. And then I don't think it gets 25 till after High Street. No, it gets 25 right at High Street. Right. It does. Hence the, okay. the, the new little sign that town has put up going, drive like our, you, your child right. lives right. in the city. Or whatever. And, and, I, and I also believe that there aren't supposed to be heavy right. no, there is a, trucks on there, Dayton Street. So if there are, they, they may be local. They, they could be local doing, um, doing work. I mean, a local, yeah, if people have all construction all projects going on, they could very well be local. Gravel truck and the weight restriction, I think, is 40,000 pounds. Uh, with the exception of farm equipment. So um, what I can do immediately is I can step up radar over there. All right, and just, just somebody control. else is aware of the trucks coming through, because I got news for you. Those trucks have come over by, not with this special request, just one time. Mm -hmm. they go, they're on a daily basis, and they've been that way since March. And what do you think would be the best time? Well, yeah. What? To, to check. Six. Six a.m. Mm -hmm. 
They come through before the whole village is up, and mostly they're people coming into the village. Okay. And I'm very happy to turn this over, but I just wanted to make it a uh, out, loud, out loud presentation so that people who are stuck at home like me uh, can still hear what's going on. And um, I talk to people in the neighborhood, all the people who ride bikes and right. all that kind of stuff, and they agree that that is a problem, and they worry about me. So that's getting across that situation. So I'm hoping yeah. that somewhere or another we address that. Okay. Yeah, I, I wanted to also mention we're going to be doing a walkability assessment this Thursday for that Complete Streets workshop. Um, and if you're available, uh, we'd love to have you. So when is that? Uh, it's 8.30 to 1 this Thursday in rooms A and B. So if you would come to the, if you can come to the Bryan Center at, you said 8.30, and come up to, up this floor and around the corner rather than in here. Okay. Of the big room around the corner. You. Somebody will, somebody, somebody will show you. If you're able to come, somebody I, will get you there. I can only stay there a while, but I will. Okay, we'd love to hear from you. I, I, coming back to this village, that's one of the things that I look forward to was being a part of the village. And I realized that when I left this village in 2005, I was having to beg for people to try and please. I went down and priced it at uh, the uh, individual rent, uh, rent pieces that could be used at stores. So you can they could do a, a joint King's Yard one rent. And, and if somebody wants to use it to get into some social problems, uh, some sort of um, business located in that area, they would just share one particular ramp with each other. But well, I'm going to text dispatch right now. Tomorrow morning uh, at 6 a.m., we'll have expert patrol over there, radar. Um, we've got school starting on Friday, so yeah. we'll. Well, it's like I said, I just wanted to bring it up as a concern and thank you. I have no problem working with your team and I like I volunteered because I used to be on one of your councils, the design council, matter of fact. Great. Long well, time ago. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Thank you, thank you very I much. A longer. That's okay. And so ladies, we're gonna ask you guys to come up to the microphone if that's okay. Hello. I'm going to just read you something here. If you could say your name. Please. name. Yes, I'm Maya Thornton Hodge. I am Serene Molnar. My name is Jessica Thomas. We've got our little comrade Sarah Morrison over there who's also at the meeting um, planning this. So thank you, Council, for giving me this time. My name is Maya Thornton Hodge. Um, as you may not know, I grew up here in Yellow Springs and have been immersed in the culture of YS as much as it has influenced me. Mm -hmm. I'm a teaching artist and currently work for the community of artists in Dayton, but would like to return home, this work home. I've been troubled by the shifting culture of the village. We have seen the number of tourists grow while the number of artists and people of diverse backgrounds decline. The arts have always been the spirit and heart of YS, hence the number of growing tourists. We tell ourselves that we value the arts and the artists that create our culture, but these villagers do not feel valued as they are priced out of their own community. For this reason, we are bringing to the council this opportunity to invest in preserving a space that has been traditionally used for the arts for our future generations. The historical Union Schoolhouse was the first integrated school in Yellow Springs. It has a history and power that reflects the ideals of the village and should not be taken for office spaces. By 2020, 45% of our residents will be over the age of 65 this is an alarming statistic, especially for the artists of all ages that come to Yellow Springs and have found it increasingly difficult to compete with a financially established and aging generation. How can the Council and the Village Arts and Culture Commission maximize on this needed space a vision for our young artists? Over 2,000 people, residential and tourists have signed 
in support of preserving this space for marginalized artists. We have collaborated with several partners who would invest in providing affordable housing structures and artistic living work spaces, including Home Inc. Let's co-create together this tangible vision. Um, let the village own a building that supports marginalized artists here in YS, just as it supports the arts and the engine for our community. We hope you will invest in this idea for future artists and culture and for the future of Yellow Springs as a whole. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Any other comments? Um, yeah, just to add to that, there are um, folks that have reached out to us that have a specific interest in investing in this idea financially, um, but none of us are interested in starting a business right now. And that's why we've reached out to, um, you know, homing as an infrastructure and then also bringing it, you know, it's kind of a socialist idea. But I feel like among the council, there are some socialist inclinations, <laughs> at least in your hearts, that, um, that the state can preserve a space for um, the community that it profits from. So you yourself, um, Karen Wintrow, have said that the arts are an engine of Yellow Springs or the engineer. Um, but what is art without the artist? And that's what this proposal is looking at with the affordable housing crisis that I believe is going to be spoken to um, after this. Um, you know, this is a way to meet both of those needs within the community and also the concern about the aging out community, the people 65 plus, is that you need the younger generation to stay and invest in Yellow Springs. You need us not to be pushed out because we provide taxes that pay for Medicare <laughs> that take care of the aging community. So um, the thing is, is that you need us. You just have to create a space for us to be able to be here through affordable housing. And this is one idea um, that I think is great. But you know, just to make sure that that need is addressed is within your own interest, both economically and culturally. And yeah. Okay. You know, for you know, including racial diversity in there is with culture, not just arts. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Um, I'm glad to hear that people have been reaching out to you. Investment partners have been reaching out. Um, you, if you do stay, you'll hear about the housing needs assessment that we're going to be working on, and I think that there will be parts of that that will be applicable. Um, I know the arts community is one of the communities that we wanted to focus on in the housing needs assessment and, and how to provide housing um, for that community. I'd like to address this because, Jessica, you reached out to me early on. Um, the Union Schoolhouse, I definitely think, deserves to be saved and rehabbed for whatever purpose. Uh, it's currently being on the market for over a half a million dollars, almost four times what it was purchased for 20 years ago. So uh, uh, quite, a, quite a big jump. It's three, just a minute, I'm talking. <laughs> um, it's, I think, three and a half acres. There are some restrictions on it, and I don't know all of those restrictions, and I don't know if they're in covenants or whatever. But it, in order to rehab it, it clearly would cost at least that much, probably more. So the total cost well over a million dollars if it's purchased for that amount. As a council person, I would support village council in some way being involved, but I don't see village council myself, I'm just speaking for myself, taking the leadership on this particular parcel at this particular time. We're just getting ready, as Karen uh, announced, to do a housing needs assessment, which will come back with clearly the information that that we know for ex that we need more affordable housing. Is this a place then that we'll, we will choose to focus on? Perhaps it will um, be, but we do own the glass farm. The village owns the glass farm, and this is, I think, one of the places where it really makes sense to focus on affordable housing because we're not going to have to pay a 
over half a million dollars to buy it. We own it. Um, but I would be happy to meet with the people who are um, interested in doing this. If there's some way that I, I can help, I would be happy to do this. Um, it would be great if Homing could get involved and Emily is sitting here. But. Well, and related to that, I know that uh, a fair amount of work has been done about artists live workspace. Um, started with Jackie Ravine's um, project and kind of extended from there. Um, I, I will echo what Marianne said. I, I think that if the village has a role in facilitating this, um, I would be supportive of that. Um, you know, again, I, I question uh, 20 years, the value appreciating by four times. I think also one of the things that was missing in the YS News article is the uh, significant expense to rehabbing the building. Um, that was not talked about at all in that article. Um, but anyway, I, I'm also, uh, I'd like to hear more. Yeah. I was going to say uh, one of the village rehabbers of historic buildings is sitting in the back row there, Jim Hammond. And uh, I, and the thing about it is there, <laughs> but just to say, there are historic preservation monies out there. It's going to be a historic preservation project, uh, a big one and a very expensive one. The shape of the building, I think the, you know, what need, would need to be done to eat, just make it safe, I think. Right. Um, is going to be great. So I don't know. I think it's great if Marianne, Marianne knows something about this, having worked with Home Inc. and, be, and knowing about development. So finding resources. Um, counts, I agree. I would also be for council. I mean, I don't think we can buy it. I don't think that's an option. But can we help support an effort, which I would think there would be actually a lot of people in the village who would hate to see that building just continue to deteriorate. So I don't know where the resources are, but you know, making a big public call, uh, maybe there's some way to, to find those local resources you know, uh, to help. And um, so you know, to the, to where the village can help in that, you know, I think it would be important. I, so I encourage you to consider, to continue uh, your efforts and be reaching out to people who have you know, the expertise to kind of help. I mean, maybe Jim would be willing to talk to you about it. I don't know. But, you know, because he's done preservation uh, also. So I, anyway, I don't know where all those resources are. But right. That's it. Thank you. So great, great plan. Look for, you know, we'll, we'll do the village between the, the housing needs assessment will actually provide some, some data. It will provide hard data that will um, that can be presented to developers and investors um, to talk about what um, what opportunities there might be and what needs need to be filled in, in the village. So, and I think that there are other ways um, financially that the village and, and in kind services and things that the village could support a project, but um, we're certainly not the lead. We're certainly um, not going to purchase the building. I think you're hearing that pretty strongly from from everyone. I don't know where there. the money would come from and right, the village's right, budget exactly. even if we wanted to do yeah. it, you know. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Um, Krista, um, you're next. Um, thanks again to the village and a lot of villagers for helping with that auction way back in March uh, of the Arnabitz property on Jacoby Creek. Uh, we came together really quickly on that and we're very successful. The two big pieces of land I do believe are going to be preserved. We were able to help with uh, the closing on one of those and have a contract uh, to do a conservation easement on that. And uh, the other piece is the Jones's bought. I think we're going to be able to, to bring to fruition with the conservation easement as well. So I think that we'll, we'll preserve at least 75% of the property and possibly some of the adjacent ones as well. Um, after that great show of support, Council Land Trust decided we had to seize the moment on this awareness of the Jacoby Greenbelt plan and uh, that west side in particular that's just really a lot of it not protected uh, despite it being a really long held village goal 
And uh, so we immediately buckled down on submitting a five-year federal grant, Regional Conservation Partnership, that would address the sub-watersheds that are the priority areas for the village. First of all, those western properties in the Jacoby Creek watershed, and then second, the Yellow Springs Creek area on the eastern side of the village, and that would include the wellhead area. Um, if we, we have a deadline now of September 7th, we have been invited to do a full proposal to follow up our pre-proposal that we submitted. Um, we're really fortunate to get this far, and I hear some very encouraged th encouraging things from our state natural resource conservation service staff because they would really like to see this kind of project with a lot of local ownership and, and some long-term local planning as a, as a part of it. Um, that includes permanent conservation. So um, we, I, I come to you asking that in the next meeting you address uh, authorization of a letter of a partner contribution committing to um, use green space funds to uh, to work with the project. Your uh, commitment of 200,000 more or less of green space funds would leverage about 3.4 million dollars in other state resources, local organizational participation, and federal money for easement purchase, and for uh, also installing conservation practices on property, which is something that we just never get access to funds for. So we think it's a really exciting project. Um, and we want to just keep building on that momentum that we that we had going this winter and this spring, um, and and try to achieve this goal. That five-year window, which can be extended to six years pretty easily, if not all the money has been spent, which it may well not be, um, is really a, a great opportunity. Um, unusual to to really be able to work with that big a window and flexibility and federal rules to work around our local programs and our local priorities. So the village, uh, if we're successful in getting this, would be a very important partner in figuring out how we want to weight our scoring systems for priority properties. And having a five-year window like that really gives landowners a nice period to, to think about what their options are as well. So, um, how I, many how many millions does that leverage? Does it? It'd be 3.4 million. It's we're looking for 1.8 from the federal government, and then another 1.8 from various resources. Uh, Central State is willing to head up the research on the project. Xylem YSI provide equipment and expertise to that. Um, community Solutions would certainly be a partner too. They've already um, launched some efforts with soil and, testing. And this money would go directly towards the easement. So unless an easement was purchased, yeah, oh, we, we would still have to go through your regular process okay. in terms. And, and but we're just so we're and committing. And round, we would get your input on the scoring system, and then we would bring those those specific properties. So. Patty, do you have what you need? And, and I guess we need, I don't know how much we want to talk about this. Is We heard Krista say 200000 from the Green Space Fund is what she'd like to see. Um, I don't know that we need to go into detail on the budget yet. Where do we? Well, actually, Krista's letter, if you do, Melissa actually did the math, and it comes to 275000 about 55000 a year. Um, in your letter that you sent, the two attachments that you the sent. The template. Us. Yeah. Okay, the first, I talked to Melissa, I think, after the first letter I did, and it sounded like there wasn't that much money in the fund. Right. So yeah. that's, we have to zero in on yeah, that. Yeah, I'd, I'd, like, I'd like Melissa just to give you a brief recap of what's in the fund, okay. just so you know. Um, currently we have, let me find the right piece of paper here. Um, <coughs> oh, currently we have 175, almost $176,000 in the fund um, because we did get a uh, $25,000 donation um, this year um, that went into the fund in, in addition to the 50000 that we annually put in there. So we have almost $176,000 in there with no further commitments that I'm aware of in this year. How much did you say we put in annually? 50 
I thought we were doing 25. Was it 25? We went down to 20. We were doing 50. We went down to 25, but we talked about putting it back. And I think and 50 went in this year because of the $25,000 right. donation. And can you talk about the sale of Sutton? Um, yes, we did receive the check for the sale of Sutton Farm um, at the beginning of June, and that was $204,580 which I did just put into the general fund because um, the discussion had not been um, yet fully had as to what we were going to do with uh, those funds and how we were going to commit those. We did talk about part of it going to the green space mm -hmm. fund and part of it going to the new crew quarters. Mm -hmm. Did we, did we, um, do we need it all to be sitting in that fund in order to commit to what, what, Cri what Krista has told me is that she would like that number to be there. She would like us to be committing to that because that gives them, um, that well, shows that we can commit but it doesn't, without having it in that fund, can't we? Because it's not something we're going to be, because we can just add to the, from the general fund? I, I think that that's possible if it's possible from your perspective. Mm -hmm. I, I just don't know how that works for staff from council to council. I, I, I don't know. So it's, are we at 150 or 175? 175. We're at 175, and how much is it? Two, 200. 205. So this year we're going to be committing. 20, so at the end, by yeah, at, so. at, at as of January one, we're going to be at 100. I mean, we could do it a little early if that helps right. the process because it's a lot of money that it leverage leverages. So right. it seems like a really so so. Good idea. I think we can. We've got it. We've still got a large agenda. I think if council kind of it's going to come as legislation, right? Potentially, I, yeah. I, I move that we go ahead and bring legislation to the next. Meeting. Well, then does that mean we wipe out our green space fund? Well, it's not going anywhere yet. It won't go well, anywhere yet. But right. if it does, it, it would well, go. If the Green Space Fund is for your priorities, right. your priorities are included in the target and, area. And this is essentially what we're saving our money for. Yeah. I mean, that's, right. that's the point of this is that this is what we're, these are the large properties west of town that we're talking about. So um, this is essentially really making better use of our money because of the amount of money that's that we able to leverage. Yeah. So I made a motion that we so um, bring it to the next that meeting. we bring legislation and, and if we need to earlier bring that you know move that twenty five thousand a little early. Okay, so that. we'll do that. So we'll add that to the to the agenda for the next meeting. And then the letter. Right. Well, so what do we need to do, Patty? Um, Krista sent a form letter, which I think Krista already sent that on to you to review um, for uh, for form, and so. Uh, once the legislation is passed, then I can sign the partnership letter with Krista, and she's good to go. Okay. So, so what is? Do we have legislation? Will we have legislation at the next meeting? Yeah. Yes. I guess that's my question. Do we need legislation? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. You're yeah, you're committing a large okay. number of funds. Okay, so we will bring that to the next meeting. I just want to appreciate, oh, I, I was thinking when I talked to Krista today, you know, about this, um, without TLT, <laughs> I mean, TLT has helped us, has helped us leverage so much, you know, state, I guess it's all, all been state funded, or is it federal also? We've had some state and federal, yeah. Yeah, federal and have, have helped, without them, you know, we just would be nowhere. With right. what and it, we, unfortunately, with the state Cleet, Ohio money, Miami Township, has not scored as well as some other places, but if you have a local commitment like this in in this program of the federal uh -huh. government, it's it's a pot just for this area, you know. Which so you're not in competition for the rest with the rest of the state or with the rest of the country once you get this award. That's great. So yeah, yeah. I mean it's, it's just, the best it's opportunity I've yeah. seen for yeah. sure to zero in. Oh, something. So yeah, so thanks to TLC. Thank you. I, I have one more question, though. Yeah. The money would be used to It would stay with e you until we were ready to purchase easements. But purchasing easements means, of course, that people are going to be willing to sell, right? Right, right. so it would be so a lot of outreach what, 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 to what would happen if you, we didn't get that many people? It's possible that we wouldn't. And then uh, with the money It's just rather unusual, though, to be able to go to landowners and say, this federal money is on reserve for your area. Um, we'd like to talk to you about this. Yeah. So, so you, and you we feel. got a few years, you know, to, to do it versus, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a little, I don't know. 
it would still very much have to be voluntary on the part of the, the landowner. But it gives you some flexibility in that window of time that's really unusual because we just operate year to year, generally with those match sources. Right. Thanks. All right. Thanks so much. Thank you. <laughs> Legislation. The next meeting. So, um, sorry, it was a little unusual with all of the the kind of two pre-planned. Um, are there any other citizens' concerns about items that are not on the agenda? I wonder if we can have a little break. Okay. We've had a break requested. We can take a break. Yes. And then we'll do pocket neighborhoods next. Week. Yes. We'll come back and get on to old business. Yeah, we're going to be passing that legislation. Yeah, all houses around Let's get started. We're going to get started. We have designated it. Guys, Dan, we're going to get started. Are you ready, Susan? I, we're going to get started. Um, so the next item on the on the agenda, the next item on the agenda, is about pocket neighborhoods. Um, we decided to move it up so our staff member could leave. Um, I actually, in reading the minutes, we had said at the last meeting, it, the minutes said we were going to have legislation. It got a lot more complicated. But tonight, it got a lot more complicated than that. So we just decided to make it an agenda item and have Denise review um, it again. Right. Um, on July 17th, I gave a short presentation to council, which was more a PowerPoint presentation, just of the concept of what a pocket neighborhood development is. Um, council, you know, you raised a couple of questions, which I did take back to the Planning con Commission to consider what they did at their meeting on August 14th. Um, but tonight, I think I just want to go over with you the heart of the regulating code, which is found in Chapter 126208, um, and that is the conditional use specific requirements. I think I'll just give you a bit of an overview of that section, and then if council does give the green light to move forward, I'll come back in September for all the pieces of other legislation that would relate. Um, pocket neighborhood developments, or PNDs, as I'm going to refer to throughout the rest of this presentation, are a type of planned community which consists of a clustering of smaller residents or dwelling units that are individually owned around a courtyard or common open space and designed to promote a sense of community and neighborliness through an increased level of contact on a single lot under the control of an HOA, Homeowners Association. In uh, 1262-08, um, the one thing that Planning Commission tried to do as much as possible was to keep the existing code that had just been updated in 2013 and try to apply as much of the existing code to the PND. So, for example, um, the, planning, the Planning Commission made an effort um, to uh, follow these requirements. So, um, a lot size maximum must be under five acres. Um, for PUDs, <coughs> planned unit developments, they're, o they're five acres or more. Um, they can be less than that, but that's a bigger process. Um, planning Commission um, also uh, had these uh, only in residential A, residential B, residential C. And following the current code for how many units can be on a property, um, you can have up to 14 units in residential C, um, eight in residential B, and six in residential A. And they kept that same thing for that. Um, they have a requirement, though, of a minimum of four dwelling units around a common open space area would be the requirement. Um, Right now, a property owner may have an accessory dwelling unit in addition to their primary dwelling. The minimum of four units was to limit the number of locations where this could work. So um, basically on a lot to be used, if there's an existing primary structure or say there's a duplex there, it can count as one of those uh, minimum of four. 
but only one. The du if it's a duplex, it's only going to count as one. And then you'd still have to have three others. Um, an existing accessory dwelling unit is not going to be allowed. Um, however, it could be converted to another use by the HOA. So an existing accessory dwelling unit would be owned by the HOA property and it would be, consider it would be used commonly among everyone. So it could be a storage area, it could be a community room, or it could be guest housing. But, but there's not going to be accessory dwelling units for each individual home. That's the in. HOA is the housing. The HOA, the Homeowners Association. Okay. The lot coverage will follow the zoning code requirements for residential districts. Um, the lot will be, as I said, under an HOA and the um, covenants, conditions, and restrictions will need to be submitted along with a conditional use application for staff and planning commission to review. Setbacks are also going to follow the zoning code requirements. Front and back uh, measurements are going to go from the perimeter property line. As we're talking about this is one lot but you're going to have all these houses on this one lot. So you will look, you'll, we'll look at the perimeter of the property line and then your set, the setback will be based on that perimeter property line, not each, each individual lot within the, within the uh, P&D. Um, frontage will be on a, a, a public street. It's not required though for the individual lots, but an entrance through an access easement can be allowed. Required common open space um, to ensure that the open space is not located all in one place at the back of a property. Um, uh, there's a minimum of 200 square feet that must be contiguous, usable, and common to all. Specifically, uh, a 50% 50% shall butt. Um, all shall be within 60 feet walking distance, and at least two sides of the common open space shall have dwellings abutting it. So at least 50% of the dwellings have to abut the common open space and at least two sides of the common open space have to have dwellings on it. Parking areas shall be approved by the Planning Commission and it's going to follow the existing requirements for parking and landscaping buffers. Um, parking is excluded from the ca calculations of common open space, so the common open space will have to be over and above those parking areas. And, we, and Planning Commission will take into consideration uh, what Council had said because we're not having individual garages at each unit that we have car possible car uh, structures parking garage like a little carport or something like that in these little parking hubs um, then they have to be within so many feet of where they're those people's dwelling units are so with with connections uh, by sidewalks or some type of pedestrian path. And it'll be up to the person designing it to show it to the Planning Commission to see if, <laughs> if it's something the Planning Commission thinks will work. Um, other standard things, lighting, you know, directing light downwards. We don't want light spill beyond the individual lot boundaries. Utility vault, we're gonna, rather than having individual meters on each property, it's gonna be a utility vault where all the meters will be located. Um, other standards that we're going to have um, in residential A, it will only be single family detached dwellings. Uh, in RB and RC, <clears throat> up to 50% could be two family and or single family attached. Uh, privately held accessory structures and accessory dwelling units won't be allowed. However, they can be allowed as part of the HOA common area. So, so that for storage, as I mentioned before, and community rooms or, or whatever, or guest housing. Um, the lot being under the control of that HOA um, is what we were asking is a draft of the conditions, covenants, and restrictions is to be submitted with the conditional use application and the level B site plan review. Um, there'll have to be a stormwater plan and, it'll, and it will be approved by a village appointed engineer and prior to the hearing, a preliminary meeting before we even start this with a developer, um, with, they have to sit down with, with the planning staff as well as utility staff, water, sewer, electric, streets, 
and explain and talk preliminary what they want to do and, and show that. Um, only the things mailboxes have to follow USPS new requirements for cluster box units and anything that isn't addressed here will likely follow the requirements then in the planning and or zoning code. Um, if council gives the green light on this then um, what you're going to be seeing is there are it's a, a total of including 126208 there's a total of nine sections of the code that are affected by this legislation um, there's one in the planning code and eight in the zoning code and you'll be seeing those at the next meeting in September um, however one wasn't publicly noticed so that's going to be out of sync a little bit Judy um, did you check to see if we're going to be able to consent agenda those by any chance? Yes, we could if there's no discussion about council about it. You know, some of them are just like words. I mean, you know, they're they're just really um, right adding P and D to definitions. one little section. right definitions yeah. and um, you know, I would think we would want the one the main. Um, section that was actually creating the pocket neighborhood we would what that separated out but everything else follows from that yeah. my answer is that I, I told you yeah i think okay. it's possible but we wanted to see how the process of discussion went okay before we made that determination i was at that planning meeting um <clears throat> where uh, the last planning meeting that discussed pocket neighborhoods I understand planning commission has been talking about it for about a year so I, I definitely felt a little bit out of the loop but I also noticed um, I mean I I just feel like we should go forward with it but I also feel that if um, proposals come before planning commission that don't quite fit some of the detail that we need to be flexible because I just had the sense that planning commission members at times you know some of the rules, you know, it's just unclear. We haven't done this before, and it, it, it seems to me that some of them were just sort of decisions made, question, not question, necessarily. If it's going to fit based on what the rules are. Yeah, uh, just and, there was and, just a lot of detail that my sense was, yeah. you know, the and, Planning Commission was kind of agreeing to, okay, well, let's do it that way. But, you know, there wasn't any real clear to me coming into the discussion light. Uh, particular necessary reason for that particular detail and there might be a, a developer come in and that de you know details and I wouldn't want us to say well no you don't fit you got to change it if there's not a good reason so I guess I feel like as we're trying this new idea that you know Planning Commission we should ask Planning Commission to be flexible and to consider is there a real purpose it's just a rule that's not really providing much of a purpose that there be flexibility and maybe over, we may discover that we need to change things and that we may be able to do that in a timely way so yeah. developers can I mean I, I came to them with a lot of things from lots of different codes yeah, that, was, that were could be very restrictive <coughs> and for the most part they really wanted to be more uh, loose about that and not have a lot of those restrictions yeah. well, like with the parking and things to, to Judith's point um, my understanding is that the density is the same as in whatever residential area mm -hmm. it's in, correct? Mm -hmm. So I don't understand why can't uh, uh, a house in a pocket neighborhood have it? What was the rationale for not allowing accessory dwellings, given that it's the same density? Because a lot of the, oh, well, there's a couple reasons. One, <clears throat> what we don't want to see is um, well, that kind of goes back to the Airbnb, so I don't want to go down no. that road right now. <laughs> no, but, don't. but basically, what they didn't want to do is like these are supposed to be homes that people live in, that that you share this neighborhood together with lots of different people, okay. of different ages. I, I so so it, and it's an it, accessory dwelling unit is not. Can, yes, can a house they, have an accessory storage unit? Oh, well, yeah. yeah, they can have. Okay. The, yeah, okay, I was wasn't right. They can yeah. have an, but it will be uh, common. Common, the yes. common thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what? Why are duplexes not? Why wouldn't a duplex be considered two units? Because they're connected. Yeah, we we're just for the purposes of of this. We we yeah, still want to have. Didn't want a duplex to restrict 
because with uh, me coming as two, because that would take away from having four units. Mm. So, so it, a duplex and, would and actually it, allow it to have a higher density. I think. Correct. Yeah, yeah. Plus, you know, under the the assumption that the duplex is already there. And those two units, we didn't want to tell anybody to say, well, we got oh, two okay. units here, you're going to have two units. So again, yeah. okay. we're, we're trying to be flexible in, because mm -hmm. we said density was important. <coughs> we, we were trying to get more versus less. Okay. So, yeah. so essentially, it's four living structures, because one, that one or two could mm -hmm. be a duplex. Well, well in, in our in R B and R C you can yes yeah. yeah but you have to have a minimum of four in right. order to go through all this process with an H O A I don't know why anybody would want right. to do anything much less than that when you have to go through the H O A mm -hmm. I mean you know we already have people have the ability to have their primary structure and an accessory structure and they don't have to deal with all this mm -hmm. business <laughs> so you know this is just a way the, that's why we felt the minimum of four. You know, because you are creating an HOA, this mm -hmm. uh, that is not going to be under the control of that original property owner anymore. It's going to be the HOA. And and who's going to be responsible for administering and ensuring that that HOA is active? Because there is supposed to be an HOA for Birch Three, and there isn't. I, I mean, it, not until it's built out. Well, well, but the planning commission is requesting the. HOA in draft form be, to be they want to look at it in draft form at the at the beginning um, I'm assuming with a with a number of these smaller properties that the people that are going to do this maybe in the beginning you all pro will probably already have a lot of your um, buyers but I mean it, I think that that the idea of flexibility I think is important but there's also a lot of commitment and promise about what this pocket neighborhood is supposed to be that needs to be administered by the HOA and if it isn't there people's investment could end up not being what they thought it was going to be I mean I so you know I'm all for flexibility but um, I think that there has people shouldn't lose the original intent of why they're mm -hmm investing in that property I, I would just like to go ahead and bring legislation on this um, just because we got a lot more to go but I will would like to also say make one final comment which is um, in my travels to St. Paul to old neighborhoods in St. Paul where there where there are large houses and then there are apartment buildings uh, the, in a way, you know, where there's there's higher density and there's lower density, and that it, it is integrated very nicely into those neighborhoods. I, you know, I work as a hospice nurse. I go into all kinds of neighborhoods in the region, and you'll see. And so, you know, tying the density of a little pocket neighborhood to the restrictions of that residence, residential uh, density. I mean, I think we at some point need to look at that again because, you know. I, I don't because I think you know we don't want to we want we don't want to restrict density as we get further from the center of the village since that's where the development's going to be ha some of the places where the development's going to be happening and I think it, it does not degrade a neighborhood so it's you know done right so I and I think we, we need apartment buildings we need we need and some of these kind of um, or these kind of community living settings you want people close together so why do you have this much larger density I don't see the necessary I think, I think for anyway from something for us to think about later like we want to try to keep things as uniform as we can even for future zoning mm -hmm. administrators and when you have covenants you don't want everybody's covenants to be different because PUDs are a nightmare um, I you know if, if there if somebody <laughs> wants more density then they can always go down the route of the PUD well, well it's just, I just raise that maybe not yeah. time for no I, I think it's a legitimate point I mean the idea is having smaller houses I think that was part of having little houses yeah. so you're having little houses but you're requiring them to have the same density as the regular neighborhood I mean part of the we're reason not requiring them to have little houses they can have whatever size house they want but I mean, isn't isn't that sort of the motivation of having smaller but but, uh, but if uh, you get a really smaller lot you're gonna it's gonna automatically force you to have a smaller footprint for your house 
Well, I, this I mean, is probably a, yeah. another a discussion for another day, but yeah. I think it's something we should consider. So what I would suggest, uh, what I would like to ask um, legal counsel is if we can do this as, as simply as we can do this, if we can put some of these more administrative pieces in a consent agenda, that would probably be helpful just to speed us through. If we can't, we can't. So we want legislation drafted for a meeting on the day. Yes, okay. yes. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Denise. Thanks, thanks Denise. Denise. Are you, you're you. all done, right? Yeah. I think so. Yeah. Good job. <laughs> you're busy today. I think so. Okay, thanks. Um, Next is the Housing Task Force proposal. Um, um, Mary housing Ann? Needs Assessment. Housing Needs housing Assessment. Needs oh, yes. Assessment. Housing Needs Assessment. I'll let you talk about that. Okay. Well, um, I'll, I'll start the discussion, but Patty is the person who really uh, developed the proposal. So um, we got a number of um, RFPs from different communities as well as uh, a couple uh, housing needs assessment. So the request for proposal is for a housing needs assessment. And uh, I want to call out to uh, Emily Seibel, who contributed the bulk of the uh, sample studies that we got from other communities. But one of the communities, uh, I think this was this RFP was based on is Nederland, um, Colorado. And we also have what they got from their uh, RFP, in other words, we got the assessment, 262 pages, I think, as, as um, Judy pointed out when she tried to attach it to uh, the, uh, the agenda. So at any rate, the, I think the request for proposal is straightforward. And Patty, do you have anything you want to say about it? Um, the only thing that um, council needs to discuss tonight, um, first uh, I'd like to add that in addition to the RFP, the draft RFP that's in there, you'll see the consultant questionnaire, which is something that we all decided that we were going to do anytime mm -hmm. we were going to hire uh, yeah. a, a consultant. So I filled this out based on my interpretation of what I know. Um, one thing we do need to discuss you do see a, a, a timeline for issuing the RFP, when the questions are due, when the answers and proposals are due, contract award. Um, but what we don't have yet is the deadline for the finished product. Yes. And so um, I know that council would like to move this along. And I believe, Mary Ann, when we talked to the, the consultants that we talked to, they indicated that two, two months they felt was a good timeline. Is that correct, or, or am I not remembering that correctly? Um, I think some of, the, our, some of the assessments took longer than that, but I would think given that we're a small community that that would be so. Reasonable. So what I would suggest to council is if, uh, if we issue a notice for the consultant to proceed on September 19th, um, I would suggest that we ask the consultant to present the finished report at the first meeting in December. Um, and if they can't make that to the second meeting in December, so it would be either December 4th or December 18th, that would give council the finished product by the end of the year. Now, we may put these RFPs out, I may put that date in there, and we may get no one who says they can finish that by the end of the year, but I would suggest that timeline at least as a starting point for the RFPs, and then when we evaluate these RFPs, we can go from there. Um, I, I wanted to, I, yeah, we need to decide on where we, when we want it to end, but I did want to, uh, I finally, and you can criticize me, I was, I know we've been kind of talking about this, I finally looked at some of the, the other RF, uh, some of the other housing needs assessments, and so I had a list of things that I wondered if it, they should be included. There are specific things, you know, in terms of the scope. Should I go over that? Why don't I, should I, um, I, I, you know, got a type, List, but maybe I could just throw this out to some extent. They're not included. Things that well, I don't. It, some of it, I, I'm not. It wasn't totally clear to me um, that it was here. Yeah, that was sort of. I mean, um, why don't I just read it out real quick? Does that Go make ahead. sense? Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, single parents and children as a separate um, versus just families. Um, yes. uh, the family structure. 
That's right. I mean, uh, differentiating single parents versus two family parents because of the, the income issues around single parents. Does that make sense in terms of the def differentiating? Uh, I mean, maybe that's already there. I don't know. Um, the rental vacancy rate, is that in there? I'm sure it yeah, is. I yeah, I okay. it is. All right. Mm -hmm. um, how are we trying to document people who have left town because of high housing costs? Is there a way to do that? Well, there is a request for them to investigate the trends, in the, uh, including the demographic trends, um, the cost trends, the availability trends, all of those. There is a request for them to look at that types of data. Okay. And, and also, we've included in here, and I think we might include a little bit more, about having um, volunteers in the community be working, be working. with so okay. some of this can okay. be done by and work. and I didn't know if there was a way to measure the people who feel they're at risk for having to leave Yellow Springs. Well we're planning on doing or some surveys of okay. the community okay. both individually and within groups. Okay, so, good. Yes. And then um, leases versus month uh, leases versus month to month, I mean I, I, mm -hmm. measuring that. I mean, the, one of the housing needs assessment results I looked at, they were talking about kind of uh, housing stability. So they were talking about leases versus month to month, you know, verse, and then talking about the relationship between landlords and tenants as predicti predictors to, you know, people losing their housing. I don't know. Um, I just throw that out. I, I can share this if you, I don't know if it changes any of the language. Um, then another thought, I, a question I have was utility costs um, and how that figures in um, because I know. And then I did wonder about because of the discussion in this one result that I saw about the relationship between tenants okay, and landlords. Let's, let's yeah. just do, so how, I would think house, utilities would come under housing costs and income mismatch. Well, well there's one called housing problems, cost burden, mm -hmm. right. high utility right. costs, overcrowding, and <laughs> the need of repair. But are we including utility costs? Yeah. yeah it's it's says, okay. okay, good. Okay, and then um, the number of uninhabited housing units, that's going to be? That, that would be part would of it. Out. Out. Okay. Yeah. Um, is unit sizes something that's going yes. to be measured? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. I had just a little trouble reading it, I guess. I don't know. Uh, I, and so public housing, affordable housing, subsidized housing, those will be, yes. we'll get numbers on those. Okay. Um, do, does the housing needs assessment so it identifies barriers to? Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then, um, do they look at the zoning code, the potential Ooh. barriers there in this yes. housing needs assessment? Okay, cool. You guys are great. <laughs> um, repurposing buildings for housing, is that something that it was in, I don't know if there's any buildings of that nature in our, that was, I mean, potentially, if that was discussed. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Well, so that's it. That's what housing I, stock. like I say, so, I think Thank the you. only thing that you mentioned that I don't think is okay. included is single parent households. Yeah, it was measured separate from families with children. They measured I single mean, that, parent households. I mean, that could households. be just added to the demographic. Families data. with children, single parent households. Yeah, mm -hmm. they actually counted, I think, the single, I mean, they looked at kind of the stresses. But, of but single a, parent a, a single parent family. household is a family. So I. Well, no, it is, but it's just that the, it's just that the um, finan financials of a single parent household is different. Well, it, it does it does say housing problems should be broken down by specific populations. Yeah, that's what it was. In, in this one, that was a, a particular right. population that was separate. Yeah. So, yeah. Single, that's all. Single Thank family you. or single parent households. And then, uh, you know, Patty brought up or when no. do, so are we going to say December and then to have it complete and um, and then unless people say it's going to take longer than that. So that I think is would be great. You know, it already does say presentation of final report should be before council on Monday, December four. Is it is it in there? I couldn't yeah, remember. It's it was a, a while under ago. schedule on page five. Okay. So it's already in there. I guess. Okay. Right. Yeah. So at the next meeting, we will have legislation. Can I answer a question? Okay, sure. We, we normally in the past we've only had one meeting in December, so this kind of says you would have two. 
if it's necessary to have a second one, is how we usually R right. say it. So, but um, yeah, so it's hopefully they can get it to us by December the fourth, and we won't have to do that. But so, do we need legislation, or is this? No, I can just issue okay. this. But John the schedule oh, okay. says that I can issue mm -hmm. this tomorrow. John, I know. Okay. I know. So, yeah. oh, John. Um. I apologize that my mother just mentioned this, uh, but did the zoning, did it? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Dan. Dan. Just a question on, on the housing needs assessment draft, and I, I may have missed some of this discussion before, I know this has come up in a couple of meetings and I haven't been to everyone, uh, but the timeline for the RFP uh, seems to be fairly near at hand, and is that mm -hmm. presuming that there's a, a pool of uh, potential um, agencies or, or groups that, or, that were ready to go with that, or mm -hmm. I, I didn't know if that would be a limiting factor? With well, the, the um, around. We've, we've actually looked at where we can advertise this to get mm -hmm. that, and um, there's a, the planning association, the Association of Certified Planners, and I don't know the exact initials of that, but um, we can advertise there. Um, we can put it out on our website. I know there are people that are waiting on this to go out. Um, so we do have interested parties. Okay. Well, it's, a, it's enough of a defined niche that there are uh, abundant respondents. And, and uh, yeah. real, I would look a real estate direction too because the, the Netherlands consultant, was they were real estate professionals. They weren't planners. Well, the, the one sort of um, potential um, group to service this that it comes to mind to me, but I don't know if it would be desirable, would be some sort of school or academic organization that might be interested in taking it on as a project. But that would be too quick for such a I was going to say, we do have a schedule on. here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't let yeah. so allow I, I, academics. I didn't know if that was, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, academics aren't always slow, but they're, they are probably, um, um, you know, it, it's a different calendar. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know the, the professionals connect it with it perhaps more than the uh, than the students involved in it. But, okay. Emily, did I see your hand? Yeah. I'm Emily Seibel with Yellow Springs Home Inc. And I just wanted to to expand on what you said. I was looking at this RFP and I think it's great. Um, but I was thinking that one of the criteria to select someone should be a uh, willingness to work with and direct volunteers um, for additional data collection because I think you would be able to save some money by engaging students and other groups and community organizations such as Yellow Springs Home Inc. to help um, collect additional data. Um, and the, I would hope that a consultant bill would be willing to do that. And then I also think there would be a real opportunity to work with some community groups on collecting qualitative data um, and really thinking about community engagement um, so that we're really hearing from the people who are struggling with, struggling with housing in Yellow Springs that might not show up to a forum or take an online survey. Um, and then uh, I was looking at the GIS mapping of housing inventory and housing availability on page four. And I think that you could also relatively easily add into that to map some demographic changes over time, uh, because I think that would be really powerful to just be able to see the changes that uh, have taken place in the community. Um, and then it, the next thing is that Liz Voigt, who I know um, did a presentation to you that was very good, she's a national housing policy expert and um, has agreed to continue playing a role um, a supportive role in this project, uh, said that phase one should really be focused on data collection, um, qualitative and quantitative of the housing needs assessment, and then phase two, maybe there are some recommendations from the consultant, but then phase two is turning it into a real locally owned action plan. Um, and so going probably above and beyond what the uh, consultant recommends and saying, okay, now we have the data, let's decide what kind of community uh, we want to be and how housing policy plays a role in that. Mm -hmm. so those yeah. were my suggestions, but I think it's really great. And it's so wonderful to see the village doing a housing needs assessment. Um, I'm just really excited about it. And, and Emily, I would imagine that you have some places that this can be advertised as well. If, 
Yes, so would, absolutely. If you would send those to me so that we can get those out. Yes, I'd be happy to do that. And we are, um, excuse me, oh, yes. I just wonder if this data could be added into the study of um, who are the, how, mm, if there's a rental monopoly, you know, being able to study um, if there's a concentration of rentals owned by a, a handful of people and how that impacts inflation of rent costs. Yeah, that would be part you, of it. Can you give your Thanks. name again? I'm sorry. Just yeah, Ree Molnar, M-O-L-N-A-R. Mm -hmm. So um, we are, there is um, outreach for um, partners, for funding partners. So if anybody's interested, um, we did uh, make a presentation to the Community Foundation. So uh, <laughs> there is hope that this will be a, um, that we will find multiple uh, partners um, to help fund this project. And we all, we have gotten a thousand dollars from Xylem. From, from, from Xylem, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. And also, um, we yeah. met with, we put in for a community foundation, a uh, YS Community Foundation grant, Karen and I right. met with them on Saturday. Um, so we hope to hear about that soon. Great. Okay, so we this w this will really be it. Um, we don't need this. Doesn't need to come back in the form of legislation. Patty will just make these changes, mm -hmm. um, review them with Marianne and I since we've been working on it and send it out. I will get those Maybe, well, Emily too. Let's it. yeah. I will get those out to you first thing in the morning. The changes that I have are to add the non-traditional households, which would be to include the single parent households. Um, add the willingness to work with indirect volunteers and also add the map demographic changes over time. Awesome. Okay, so we should get our comments back to you tomorrow. <coughs> uh, right? Yeah, I will send this to you first thing in the morning right. and then if you, you get them to back, get back to me tomorrow, um, I can hopefully get them out before I have to leave tomorrow. Yeah, okay. Yeah. okay. Great, good. And then Emily can send me the other places to advertise this. Okay. Um, Marianne, back to you for the Housing Task Force proposal. Yeah. So, um, as, as uh, council can see from the housing needs assessment, it's a, depending on how much data we in the end actually ask for, it's a, it will get a lot of information back. The, the Netherland per, uh, assessment was 262 pages, I think. So, um, for that reason, plus, as Emily said, we want to own this, uh, take the information, and then decide how we're going to use it and how we want to um, advance housing development in the community based on our values and and the data that we get back from the assessment. So um, I've been, Patty Bates and I have talked, and we definitely want to involve the community in this. And we also want to involve the community in a way that we can move forward with both uh, as the assessment is being developed and then after we get the results of the assessment to decide what does the village government want to do with the glass farm is one piece, but this really is looking at housing throughout the village. So uh, my recommendation is that we create a housing advisory committee that is uh, connected to the village manager, um, which um, means then we can, uh, and in the, this proposal it suggests that council and anyone can submit names that they think, people who um, have experience in housing development, people who have experience in community development, people who uh, work who can do group process well. And I'm suggesting that this be a committee, in, in my proposal I said eight to 10 people, but really as I've thought about it, probably eight people, because I think one of the things this group would need to do is reach out, not only to individuals in the community, but to reach out to groups. Reach out to churches, reach out to 365, reach out to the men's group, reach out to the seniors, reach out to the schools, and figure out ways to engage those groups um, effectively so that they can talk about 
what they see as housing needs. Um, so I've, uh, well, Patty and I actually wrote this proposal, um, and uh, I will open it up for council discussion. Well, um, Marianne is my dear friend. We are both passionate about affordable housing, but I am very opposed to this proposal. Um, and um, because I think uh, the village council needs to be the lead, needs to be in the center. We need to be leading this discussion. We are the elected representatives, and that is our responsibility to meet what I see and what many in the village see as a crisis around housing, a crisis around affordable housing, and for many people, it's a, it's a huge question. They've already left. Some have already left the village. It's, it's really pushing people out of the village because of the lack of affordable housing. Um, I have a sense, I mean, I think that it's really the time to move on this issue. Um, peop, there is a growing sense uh, that there is a crisis at hand that something needs to be done and the village council is responsible to make something happen. Um, we know what the negative impacts are, you know, the loss of the loss of diversity in our community. Many are house co housing cost burdened. They're spending a too high a percentage of their income on housing in order to be here and many have been forced out. Um, I think if we want to make a committee, I think it's premature to uh, when council has not considered, has not discussed uh, its own work plan for this major policy area of housing and affordable, and primarily the great need for affordable housing. Um, I agree with Marianne's goal that we need we need to have deep participation, particularly of people who don't generally participate because they're parents of small kids. They're working one and two jobs to try to, to stay here. Um, but I think it, new committees take a while to get on their legs. Uh, a committee is not going to represent the village. We represent the village. We've been elected to do that and to advocate for the needs of our community. Uh, but, a, but if we need a committee, and I think we've already got the committee at hand uh, to do this, outreach, I would suggest that we ask Human Relations Commission to do this for us. They care about affordability. It's part of their, uh, their job uh, in terms of uh, supporting our community. And I think we could ask them to play a role. They're established. They have relationships in the community. They can reach out to our nonprofits um, and the other organizations in the village, the other commissions. Um, and they can help us to get that qualitative data and that, and that in deeper involvement that we want to see happen. Um, I think uh, the, the, the political nature of these decisions around development of housing, affordable housing in particular, and development of the grass, glass farm, like I say, Village Council, we're responsible to lead this discussion. We need to advocate for it. Um, we need to um, articulate for our community, you know, the sense that something, you know, done in a, in a timely manner that doesn't take that doesn't just drag out for years, that we can, we're the ones that can help to make that happen. Um, I have talked with Liz Voigt a couple of times. I'm sorry I missed her presentation uh, because I was out of town. Talked to Alice Jacobs, Lori Askelin. These are strong advocates for affordable housing in the village. That is, should be our primary focus. Affordable housing should be our pri primary focus. That is the crisis that we face. Uh, but I talked with them. Um, about my concerns regarding pitfalls of placing a lot of authority in a committee, uh, a committee that is appointed by staff and with our input, of course. But I, again, I think we need to take the lead in this. We need to be in the middle of this. Um, and I think we need to articulate that the issue of, afford of affordable housing is no longer an issue of controversy in our community. We need to stop acting like it is. I was at the Pulse meeting of the, of the schools a couple weekends ago, 150 people were present, and the, the, affordable, the affordability crisis was a central discussion at that meeting. 
So I would like to make the following suggestions about how we move forward because I think it is time and I appreciate um, again that you know Marianne really has been taking the lead and helping us get started thinking about this. Um, so I would suggest the following steps first and you know these are first these are suggestions and I'm sure I don't have this all perfect but um, that we make affordable housing a central central focus of our work for the remainder of this year and for the village council 2018-19 on the issue of housing needs and most importantly on the need for affordable housing and the way we are t we show that central focus is that we have monthly discussions at council meeting so one meeting a month there would be a discussion uh, which would lead to decision making on uh, on next steps and to keep this process moving forward um, that we finalize we've done that tonight the housing needs assessment RFP and move forward on completing the work by the end of the year um, that we create uh, that we identify, you know, our our um, plan. The village council starts. That we actually have a discussion about, you know, what we see as the next steps. You know, that we get the housing needs assessment back. We, um, you know, we move forward on, you know, how to develop a plan to meet our needs from that. I expect after that a master plan. Uh, of the glass farm would be the next thing we would want to be doing. We'd be developing an RFP for developers to help us make that happen. And obviously there would be discussions going on through that process. But I would see a lot of that discussion, not the only place, would be at council table. Um, let me just look over my notes here. Um, yeah, I would like to see council decide on a framework and a time frame uh, for for addressing issues of our issues of housing and affordable housing, and then decide: Do we need another committee that could help us with particular work? And if we do, at that time, I think we should consider, you know, creating a committee. But as all of us know, the council committees, the new committees, um, it takes us it takes months. To really get a committee on board, but they're and, and if they have too broad, I mean, basically, council. It's not clear uh, in Marianne's proposal, Mary, Marianne and uh, and Patty's proposal, um, what council's role is. What is council doing? We sound like we're waiting. We're waiting for this committee to do its work and make recommendations to us, and we're kind of sitting passively back. And I am, like I say, I, I feel like we should be in the center of this uh, of this process. That's all. Thank you. But somebody's got to do the work. And council typically discusses and doesn't actually do the work. And that's what I guess I see a group like this I, doing. I'd just like to respond just briefly because okay. Judith and I really do see this fairly differently. Um, yes, uh, committees can take a long time to get together. But that is the reason that uh, I have suggested that this be under the village manager who is under village council and that it be a very small and committee that can then start reaching out to the community and by making the commit by selecting people and then having strong leadership I think we it can do its work and it's a lot of work and I don't know that I don't believe that council is prepared to do the kind of work that we want to do to reach first reach out to the community to get input and then to start working on how we're going to develop a housing to develop a housing policy council the buck stops here this is an advisory board it's not a decision making board so I will stop Jerry It's, it, it, it's, it's a tough one. You know, I'm I'm looking at the schedule for the remainder of the year, and and you know we got budget exercise we're getting ready to do, uh, which which takes time. Um, I 
I have to agree with, 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 with I, I understand what Judas is saying, but I have to agree somewhat with Marianne that we, we have a small group and, and it has to be a dedicated group under the leadership of Patty. I think it's what you're saying. Um, but if it goes anything like the uh, Justice Task Force, it won't get done this year. And that's why I <coughs> do this uh, concern. Um, I don't, I, I, I do not have an answer right now. I'm here, I'm, um, I hear the two, but, you know, I decide. Well, I guess I'd like to explore a hybrid um, I, I, I think it is pretty important to me as well that council is actively involved. And I'm not saying that this proposal is, is uh, I guess, precluding that, but I'd like it to be more thought about. Um, and then that does kind of tie back to the RFP, because the only thing I saw in the RFP was a, a report back to the committee. Um, there's some mention about engaging council, but I think that's meant more as our ideas. I, I don't know, it just wasn't so clear to me. So You're talking um, about Marianne's report on the, no. the RFP. The housing yeah. needs assessment. Um, so, um, I don't, but I don't want to hold up the RFP, for sure. Um, but I guess I, yeah, I, I, I see the value of using community expertise. Um, but I also think it's important that we're uh, actively involved in this. Um, and, you know, I try to think about some different analogies. I mean, one thing that we have definitely talked about uh, as council members many times is it's our responsibility to make sure that we control uh, the consulting process uh, in the sense of costs and making sure that we get what we want. That's very important to me. The second thing I think about is um, the, uh, the process with the um, fiber. Mm -hmm. um, I, I guess I felt that, you know, because we didn't really hear about it until the end, um, maybe we could have had it more of a role in directing that. I don't know. So, like Jerry, I don't have all the answers right now because I'm just, you know, processing this. Um, but that would be my recommendation is if we could think about some kind of hybrid. Well, you could, uh, just, I'm sorry, Karen. Do you no, go ahead. Um, first of all, I, just two things. Um, whatever you choose to do, um, I think it's important that you make a decision quickly because the, the months while these folks are trying to work, I mean, it's going to slow them down if we're not ready to go with whatever we're going to do. Um, because if whatever form this takes, the the idea is to have that group of people help them with the data gathering and the interviews and the you know the trends and the anecdotal information. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be the first thing. And the second thing is that you can set periodic report outs to council. And if you want them to come once a month for the time that they're working, then they can come once a month for the time that they're working. I mean, that's sort of what I, what I'm I guess putting out there. So a, you're yeah. talking about the consultant or the committee. Which I mean, council would prefer. I mean, if the consultant's out of town, you have to remember that every time you make right. them come into town, that's going to add your cost. I, I think that there is a lot resting. This whole discussion is really resting on this housing needs assessment. So I feel like that has to be prioritized. And I agree with Emily that in, and what's in here that we will need local help. We will need local people helping to do that information gathering. Whether it, you know, the committee might be a way to do that. But I also, on the other hand, don't want that whoever those people are have to respond. We can't have consultants held up because we have local people that aren't responding and that aren't providing information. So to me, the priority is to get this housing needs assessment done as quickly as possible with you with the best utilization of resources and I'm not sure how I see it's going to have I agree with Brian maybe it's some kind of a hybrid but I don't necessarily want to seed over work that should be done by the professionals to 
a committee either. I mean, I think that, and I think, and I don't think. I mean, one place I do disagree with you, Judith, is the is the is the um, um, Human Relations Commission. I don't see. I see them as 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 potentially having a, a role, but there needs to be real estate expertise. There needs to be planning expertise. This isn't just about human relations. So I, I don't, and, and they're already busy doing things. So I think that this, perhaps there's a representative or two from, from human relations, but I think that this needs to be a separate group that's committed over the next few months to commit the time that's gonna have to be committed to this. Very similarly to the, to the um, steering committee that did the visioning plan. I mean, that those people met that they got work done, and I think that that's what's going to have to happen. And I do think it needs to be more, um, more transparent. I mean, I, I I don't think that the that the uh, um, the whole fiber thing went real well. I'm not sure why, but that's it, I think it needs to be more transparent, and, and council does need to be more involved. It sounds so. We're looking at issues about the consultant as well as how we do this within our, whether it's all, totally all council or some, some group that works with council. I, I mean, I th council's clearly going to need, would need, uh, this, pro this, prog this process is going to take technical support. We are going to have to hire technical support. There's no question about it. If we're talking about developing a master plan for the glass farm after we get this housing needs assessment information back, there's no question we are going to need technical support. And I'm not saying there's not a place for, there may be a place for a citizens committee. I think it needs to be absolutely central that affordable housing is central to the commitment of that committee. Uh, because that's the crisis that we need to be addressing. Um, but I, so I think, you know, but I think that we may want to set up a committee. I'm not sure yet, and I don't think council, since we don't really haven't, you know, we got the housing needs assessment coming, and, and you know, and then the results of that, and then we have sort of, I know there's other sites in the village, but the big next thing will be developing a master plan for glass farms. I believe. So Judith, we have actually told partners that this is going to be a broad housing needs assessment that's going to address housing besides affordable housing. I understand. So I, no, the housing needs assessment that? is going to show the, all the housing need of the village, I assume. But the village is, the role that village council, I believe, should be playing once we have that information is looking at the crisis of our community, which is affordable housing, the lack of it and the affordability issue. I think we're really at a pinnacle. I, I really believe this. Um, uh, we are at a point where that, it's, that is the crisis. Presumably, you know, uh, st you know, market rate housing, and some, there is gonna be some on the glass farm. I think there's, you know, there is gonna be some how much, you know, we haven't, that's a decision we'll have to make. But, so there are gonna be markets, you know, cost housing development going on out there and there will be developers who presumably will respond to an RFP that we eventually, I mean that's way down the road, a little bit down the road here, but, um, and I know there are those other needs also, but for the part, you know, government to me, what government does around housing is to help, you know, help the people that market, market the market is not meeting their needs for our community um, because it's too expensive, it's nothing against contractors and you know realtors it's just that's just the costs of our community have become so high I mean uh, uh, Emily was pointing out to me that you know not very long ago low-end housing in the village $150,000 and now it's $200,000 is what you're looking at that's a huge increase and that gets beyond what a modest income person could possibly think about getting a mortgage on 150, it's pretty much over their head too, but 200, it's out of reach. It's totally but, out of reach. I mean, so. but. So that's all I'm saying. I'm not saying the housing needs assessment isn't going to identify these other needs and that there's not other properties in town where housing will be developed. You know, hopefully we can make that happen. You know, there's the Kinney Farm, there's other farm, you know, places. But um, I do think the primary focus of Glass Farm will be affordable housing and should be 
And that's the place where we should be focusing most of our energy. It's not that we won't look at anything else, but. And it, I, it seems like you, do you feel like if we have a small citizens group that is working with council and uh, the village manager, that somehow they're not going to get this, especially if that's what they're, in, if, if we're telling them that, I, I don't. Well, my problem with the way this is, this it's, is that it's it's not really relating to us. It's Patty's subcommittee, and it's um, Patty is uh, no, I works for that. us. I understand that, but then they're making recommendations to us rather than us advocating for what we as representatives know needs to you know what we want to advocate for. We're we're sort of put in a passive position, which I find. Uh, how do we know, Judith, until we have the housing needs assessment? How do we know it's what needs to be done until we get the housing needs assessment done? <laughs> well, I believe that that's true. I think because I talk to people in town, I believe this is a true thing. But um, if we if we want to think about a committee, I think I mean I want to know. So is there a role going to be to get more people, per, you know, coming to the housing needs assessment? I think we should think about it a little more. Maybe what we should do is not make a decision tonight and think about it a little bit more. The way this, the way this is uh, written, I feel like we're put in a very passive role and then, if we, and then we're going to get recommendations. Who knows when we're going to get them? And, uh, and then we're going to maybe reject them or... Are you, are you willing to work with this or are you just like, this is the way it is? Because I'm concerned. If, if you have, if you're in this place of like, it's my way or the highway, which is how I'm getting from you, then I'm not sure where to go with this. If you're willing to like work and figure out, okay, how can we be assured that council is in the driver's seat, mm -hmm. that what we do is both effective and happens relatively quickly, then, then, then that's another thing. Um, so did you what understand I, my question? Yeah, um, I, uh, this proposal, I mean you know that, I told you previously that I, I didn't support this proposal, proposal as it's written, you know, is there some and other I way? I guess I would have liked that if you had, you know, you've listed a bunch of things, Yeah. but it would have been really great, Judith, <laughs> if you had put that in the packet so we could have looked at that. I thought about doing that and I because thought it was it's premature. As you know, it's really hard yeah, to get great. information, a lot of information, yeah, at a council table and then try and work it out. Right. So, well, so can um, we? Can the two of you work on this? <laughs> I don't know. We, <laughs> we sort of agreed we decided we just, couldn't. <laughs> well, let, let's hold, hold on a second. Okay. We, we decided to go out with a housing needs assessment. Yeah. Okay. And based upon the RFP and so forth, I think it says we would have, we want to have that back by the... December. By December, okay? So, <clears throat> until I see that, I don't really know which way that I should go. Now, it's, we can, we can make some tentative plans as to what we feel we might need to Why do once we get it, that? but... You know, until we get that. Uh, no, well, yeah. there's a piece. There's another piece, though. And the piece is engaging the community. Mm -hmm. And um, that's part of what this, is, this recommendation is looking at, of having a small group that goes to different groups in the community and, and works with the provider to get the kind of questions we think, but engages the community to get on the ground sort of feedback from people in the community. Okay, so, so I guess I'm totally confused now. <laughs> the housing need assessment, we told them what we want, we want to get. But, but a good housing needs assessment, my understanding and I would, is to actually have people from the community, it's better if people from the community do this and the provider, go out and talk to people then, in the community. Then, How do then, you feel? Then why are we going out with a house, going out with an RFP to have someone do Be, it? Because there's a lot of hard data that we're not asking volunteers to do. We're asking volunteers to go to 365, to go to the men's group, to go to a church and but say, hey, what's going on? To me, that's where the problem is going to run in because we're contracting with one and we're depending on another. No, this would Don't be working do it together. together. 
Yeah. Yeah. We'll That's what it, it says in okay. the RFP. Then, then what these folks, these volunteers yeah, these do, volunteers. if they don't get the data to the housing and needs assessment folks, do we care? They won't. I, I don't see them necessarily gathering data. Okay, I see well them setting up meetings, yeah. facilitating meetings, facilitating then, contacts, doing outreach about what's happening. I mean, it seems to me that that, it, and and the the woman who was here, um, I'm sorry, Liz, Liz. Liz, Liz said that that's very a very important piece. Emily has said that it's a very important piece. So it seems to me that we can at least start with a group that's going to be a facilitation group for the housing needs assessment and what what it morphs into or what comes after that is maybe another step to discuss. Can we at least start with that, Marianne? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I mean does Yeah, it also occurs to me that I mean if we as Emily suggested are putting out in the RFP the importance of this community engagement, shouldn't the, the providers be coming up to us with some ideas as well? So I mean, I think we can take, I mean, you know, as we're evaluating the consultants, um, I mean, they should have some ideas about this also. So I, I feel that, um, I don't know, we should, to me, we should discuss this again, the whole sort of process piece, but we should get the assessment, uh, the RFP out there. Well, I, want, I do want to point out that I believe that somewhere in the RFP we put that we would have volunteers who would assist them. And I'm not saying that necessarily this committee has to be that those volunteers. I'm just saying that is part of the RFP and is something that we put out. Right. Well, we could word it similar to what Emily said that a key criteria is this community engagement and we can also mention some different ways that that would happen working with council working with citizens and we can take a little bit more time i think to formalize how this is going to work actually what the rfp says and it says some different words on page four it says that there'd be a presentation of initial data to the steering committee right. so that you use the steering committee and then the next sentence it says engagement with community advisory group so it's using two different words for so maybe we should take that out should, and just make it a little bit more general I mean they should be bringing it back to the village council and bring and reporting it out here I don't want it being reported out to a committee that we're not even sure what it is yet and of course if at the last if we decide if we in the, these next weeks discuss this and you know has some, has some slightly different idea we can let them know that, right. th that they're gonna you know but I would want them reporting out to us um, because I think that's going to be very important and obviously we, we might want it to be a special meeting maybe we want it to be a special meeting I don't know uh, and, and really so. encourage people there to be there but well we also said uh, on this the answers to questions will be posted on September 7th so if we have if we have worked out a more fi you know final process on the committee or whatever that's going to morph into, we can present that then. Well, you have one more meeting to do that. Then. Right. So, I mean, I don't. I agree. I don't. You said that we should decide this soon, and I think we should. Right. Um, I don't know. I, I'm not ready to make a decision. I've heard some things that I think are really good. I, I like the timeline thing. I like the community engagement. I like active involvement of council. So, it, I think maybe the answer is language to to the about um, a key criteria and look to them for their recommendation. And if we don't like, I mean, what they recommend as far as community engagement will be part of the criteria for selecting the consultant. So, um, so just so I have this correct, you want me to remove the part about the presentation of initial data to the steering committee and also the engagement with the community advisory group. You want me to take those out, but you want me to add under the criteria that um, community engagement is key and that we have an engaged community that's interested in being involved in the process. And that there will also be presentations, you know, to council and things too. I mean, I think we should still yeah. leave that in there, just not nail it down yeah. yeah I mean those were actually things that I kind of just went over my over me you know yeah I never expected that this report would go to anybody but council honestly and I, I just you know I just kind of skimmed over these 
Okay. Which report? The that's the two the thing about presentation oh, initial. Yeah, I, see, yeah. Yeah, I mean I always expected that this yeah. final report would go to council and would probably be a special meeting and um, well it does say the final report does. This just is the initial data. Oh. is what that's talking about on page four. It does say in there that the final report will come to council on December fourth. Yeah, but I'm not even sure what that means to be honest. What the that's initial right. data would be the steering committee. I don't even know what that means. Well, I think isn't that what we're talking about? I mean, that that we want to have council or whomever be engaged as the consultant is working, rather than wait till the very end to get all the information. Well, I'll add um, benchmark presentations and the general requirements as well. I mean, if if uh, if if he if the he or she reports to. Patty, you know, along the way, and I don't know if they always need to come or you can, you well, know. Well, they can, they can provide a written report to council as well, or we right. can Skype maybe so, or something that. Yeah. So when I was suggesting that we have like a monthly discussion, I mean, right now it'll probably be around the housing needs assessment, you know, for the rest of this year is what I would imagine, because that's the step we're on. Um, but how do we get broader participation? I mean, can we use the nonprofit network in town? And there our is no, no. Oh, oh. yeah, there is the nonprofit network. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then, I mean, mediation. Clearly, the mediators have been doing great work at helping us have these larger discussions. And I mean, I don't know how to do all of that. Maybe Homiek's got some ideas. About well, I mean, the, the group we got together, the first meeting in the senior center, you know, we've already gotten what the people we consider the stakeholders, um, and which could be broader, but I think that, you know, that's how we're going to get engagement. You know, go to the PTO to get engagement of parents. Go to the artists to get the engagement of the artists. You know, we, we know who those groups are, and mm -hmm. we do have connections. So, I mean, the faith community, um, right. obviously. Yeah. So I think okay. okay. I will make those changes. Okay. An RFP. So it's going out tomorrow, right? Uh, I'm gonna. I'll probably actually go back to my office and do this tonight, just because I want to do a well fresh in my mind and send it to Karen and Marianne, and they can review and get it to me, and I will send it out tomorrow. Okay, Council, do we want any, oh, my thing went dead. Um, oh, do we want John to do any, uh -huh. oh, sorry, John, go ahead. Oh. Hi, I'm John Hempling. Um, so I guess I do see some role for a committee for dealing with the um, housing needs assessment, um, but in, the, uh, in Marianne McQueen's recommendation, I guess this has already been beaten to death at this point, but um, the the uh, the charge was more expansive to include uh, recommending what types of housing, uh, basically what income levels to be served, um, like et cetera, et cetera. Like basically recommending on broader sort of policy political questions as opposed to technical data collecting questions, um, where and uh, you know basically the the argument being that uh, for the more technical data collecting questions. Um, they're not that controversial. Ultimately, everyone should be able to get all the answers that they want um, from the from the data collecting process um, versus the more political questions of um, what the village will do about the, the housing needs uh, seems like an area that village council should be um, taking the lead on. Thank you. So do we want to do anything to foreshorten um, the agenda? We've got the smoking limitation policy for village-owned property, uh, review of council's 2017 goals, and excuse me, Becky, you wanted to say something. Becky Campbell, I hope you'll remember to do this housing assessment for the community, not for just Home Inc. Thank you. In terms of the goals, Karen, um, I, I, I looked back through it, and I just, I guess I, think I was the one that asked it to come back on the agenda. I think you mm -hmm. can take it off unless somebody else. Because then you discuss it at last meeting. Yeah, and well, what I did, what I did was I went back and put a few more finite. I added another category. I put a few more finite um, dates and and 
things in there because you had said you wanted to sit down and kind of look at what we have left the rest of the year. Um, you know, I think we kind of know what we're doing. I don't know that, and, and I feel like it's we're we're almost in the in the fourth quarter, so I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I feel pretty good about I feel pretty good about actually where we are in with all of those goals, and um, that at this point I feel if, as if the rest of council is okay with it that. We've got it documented and we're ready to yeah, move forward. Good. Cool. Um, the smoking limitation policy um, for village-owned property, do we want to address that or do we want to push that off to a different meeting? Um, I want to address it, but I think we should push it to okay. the next meeting. Is that okay with everyone? Mm -hmm. And so, Brian, you had a few things to say about complete streets. Yeah, just one quick thing. Um, we had had a to be determined for a community forum uh, following the complete streets workshop. So, what's been recommended is September seventh uh, from seven to nine p.m. That's a Wednesday. Uh, what now? Do for what? For a community forum piece cool. that we said that we wanted to do after the workshop. Um, so this was basically to educate the community on complete, uh, complete streets. Um, so yes, September 7th, what? Yes, that's HRC night, just for so that you know. It's a Wednesday though, isn't it? No, no September 6th. It's a Thursday. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, that's the only date I've got that, they're, that I know they're available. So. And who's, okay. I'm sorry, who's uh, making this, the presentation? This is all Miami Valley Regional Planning Commission. So this was that um, when we had this sort of first step was the workshop, second step community forum. I mean, I'm not saying it can't ha both happen the same night. I'm just mm -hmm. saying as a matter of information that it's HRC night. Okay. So is, are we... Uh, Back to square one, or are we? Well, I can uh, I can try to find another day, or we can say yes to September seventh. And it has, it, I mean, a lot of people from in the RPC are coming, right? Uh, there's three people. Mm -hmm. Quite frankly, if you try to avoid every other meeting, you're going to have a heck of a time right. scheduling anything. So that's true. And you said 7 p.m.? Yeah, it'd be 7 to 9 p.m. I'm not my favorite night, but it doesn't look like there's a lot of choice. Oh, and it's going to be here? Uh, yeah, so I, I think we would... Um, Actually, we could do it in council chambers if it's available, but if, if HRC is in here, we could do it in rooms A and B. Did you change the date from Thursday, August 24th? No, it's two different meetings. This is, yeah, this is the public. And they're, they're going to have an opportunity, they're going to have enough time to, to distill all the information they're getting in the workshop and the walking um, assessment. They felt that they were, but, um, I mean, but we can, we can look for another date later if we want to wait. I didn't bring my calendar. Yeah. Sorry. I'd almost be interested to see, is it something that has to happen? I mean, do you think it, we, we need the, a public forum like that before it's come back to council? Um, I, when, when I presented it last time, I said, um, uh, I don't know, that I, was, uh, I could go either way. Okay. So I, there seemed to be a sense that we should we should do a community meeting. So what what time frame you start about? Um, so if it was September seventh, it would be seven to nine. Um, all right. Well, how just, many council we members? Wait? How many council members are going to the complete streets? I'm going. Brian's going. Are you going, Jerry? On this Thursday. No. I'll okay. Because um, I guess I'm. I guess it does. It honestly, now that I'm thinking about it, it is feeling like we're missing a step. You know, I'm really not sure if you know. Count. You know, we've committed. Council is committed to looking at complete streets, but I don't know that we really know what's entailed, and it feels like to go to the community with 
having a workshop or having a forum that it, it really might be too soon. Okay. Is Marianne, what do you think? I'm actually not thinking. <laughs> I'm trying to prepare for my committee reports. <laughs> okay. Well, All right, so we're going to wait. We'll just hold off. Yeah, okay. Um, manager's report. Uh, as you can see, our many projects are moving along. Uh, Judy has a picture of the solar array, which is actually all of the all of the supports for the solar array. Um, they are should be putting the uh, actual panels on uh, very soon. Uh, but while she's getting that up, um, we are looking at construction being done there sometime uh, towards the end of September. They got put behind a little bit because of the rain. It gets quite wet out there. Um, I'm sure many of you have seen that Majors Enterprises has returned to the project uh, at Dayton Yellow Springs in East Enon, and they should also be done by the end of September. There is the solar field um, from the bucket truck, I believe. Um, and you can see all the posts that were driven in and the, uh, the fences up, and um, they're working on the electric and getting the meter in, and we'll be off and running pretty soon. Sutton Farmhouse will be burned by Miami Township Fire EMS for training on Saturday, October the 7th, so a week before a uh, street fair, so if you want to put that on your calendar. The water plant, we talked about that uh, earlier this evening, as well as the medical marijuana facility. And yard waste, um, there has been a problem with the dumping of yard waste in alleyways and on adjacent properties that people don't own. Um, and this is becoming an issue. It creates aesthetic and potentially hazard uh, health and safety issues. So please, if you have yard waste, um, do not dump it over your fence in the alleyway or on adjacent properties. Um, it, we do have the bags that you can uh, buy down in the utility office and Rumpke picks up yard waste the last Friday of every month through October, mm -hmm. Melissa? November, no, I think. Okay, through November. So we are going to be sending out uh, those letters to, uh, if you own property along an alleyway, we will be sending you a letter. This doesn't necessarily mean that you are particularly in violation, but we just want everyone to understand the uh, responsibility for maintaining that property. And I am in the process of trying to get that done before I go on my vacation, which begins on Friday. Awesome. So I will be gone uh, after Thursday until uh, the day after Labor Day I come back and Melissa will be here handling all of those issues. So if you have any problems, please contact Melissa. Okay, thank you. Can I ask you on the alleyway thing, are you going to um, be putting in that, that, you know, people's responsibility to trim things back and everything? Yes, Good. And mowing probably yes, behind their house. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, Melissa? Um, as you noticed in the consent agenda, in agenda tonight, there were not financials. Um, I did check the requirements, and I can do those quarterly. So I will be doing those at the second meeting on a quarterly basis with the first one to occur at the second meeting in October. So, And then that will allow time for a brief presentation and highlights so that it's not just a bunch of uh, numbers and pages <laughs> dumped into Thank a consent you. agenda. <laughs> And then um, 2018 budget is two meetings away. This will be my fifth budget, so it will be that much more riveting than the previous four. So that's it. Um, I, I do have one other thing. Brian had asked me to include the dig once memo in, in the packet because he did not realize that that policy had been formalized back in April uh, via memo. Uh, so that is included in your packets as well. And now I'm done. Chief? Show off that fabulous shirt. <laughs> I could use a new one. <laughs> so, um, school starts Friday. Just reminding everyone to watch their speed, drive carefully, watch out for all, all of our residents. Um, as an innovative solution to the needs of the PD, I'm very excited to request from council that uh, we add two corporal positions to the ranks. I believe there are a number of reasons to consider such an innovation, the most critical being the following. A more balanced staff and structure for the department, incentive and growth potential in the department 
which positively impacts employee retention, supervisors on all shifts, increased knowledge and experience of officers who are promoted, providing the sergeants relief from some patrol functions to allow them to better focus on and complete all of the uh, numerous administrative duties that I have added to their tasks. The idea makes sense from a budgetary standpoint as well for the following reasons. Promotion from an officer up to the rank of corporal would cost the department about $2,300 a year additional for each corporal. Promotion from an officer to a sergeant would cost the department $4,634 per individual per year. So I get two corporals, two supervisors that move up the ranks for the same as adding one more sergeant. And this provides me that growth and incentive in the department to keep people on board and have long careers here. So I've discussed these changes with, uh, of course, the command staff and with village manager Patty and Melissa. Uh, I hope that council will positively consider our suggestion. So, Chief, just to clarify, though, for for council, that um, instead of a third sergeant, you're talking about two corporals. You're not talking about two corporals in addition to correct. A So what's the process that this, do we have a corporal position within our ranks? No. So, no. so, so we have to make the, so the legislation that we, we passed um, where it previously said a captain and two sergeants, mm -hmm. we changed that to three sergeants. What um, Chief Carlson is asking is to make it two sergeants and two corporals instead. And so it would be another piece of legislation that would have to come before council. Um, and we can either bring that in draft form next time or we can bring the legislation or we can add it for discussion, whatever council wants. It's an ordinance, correct? Correct. Yeah. The two, two reads, yes. Um, well, I just want to say I, I, I talked to Brian and Patty about this and I think it sounds like a great idea. And um, Thank you. Yeah, let's go forward with it. I uh, I think it is important, you know, being in Brian's report, I would just ask Patty into the future, you know, when there's this kind of proposal coming from staff, that it get on our agenda, because I think uh, people don't look at the reports necessarily for possible new legislation, so, or these kind of ideas. So do you want the legislation? As Since there's two readings, I think it's fine, but I think Brian, you know, will be presenting his recommendation again, I assume, at that, during that discussion. Okay. Just to clarify, were, Judith, were you saying that where it says chief report, you'd like it like colon recommendation regarding? No, I just, I think, um, you know, this, this uh, we usually have a discussion before we do legislation. I just thought it should have been a discussion piece. Uh, so like a new business item? Like wow. a new business item. So that, you know, it just gives everybody more, you know, and they don't have to read very carefully. They'll see it right on the agenda. There's this proposal coming. Well, discussion. I mean, it could be a, it could be a discussion item um, at the next if, on, at the next meeting if you'd prefer, but. Um, no. I think Chief was okay. indicated that he'd like to move it forward okay. more quickly. Move so forward, I, as long as we have a discussion and then we have to read this since there's two readings, I think it's fine. Okay, thank you. Um, in other news, uh, I'm adding the additional phase that I've mentioned before to our field training program, uh, which is a standard 9 to 12 Opata FTO program. Um, this additional phase at this point will consist of time on patrol with the uh, officers who have made it through FTO with me. And we're going to patrol, focus while we're in the cruisers on discussing and understanding the guidelines for the village policing, which I think would just be a great cap at the end of a, a good training session and kind of cater the officer's style to the village. I've got one thing I want to add to you guys because it's a real good feel good. Um, I received a card today and a note from a citizen. I'm just going to keep everything anonymous, but what really kind of touched me on this is. She wanted to let me know how a brief conversation went with an officer on a traffic stop. And 
Uh, she talks about her a medical condition, which I think was understood. But the very end of this is what gets me. Uh, two things. Thanks for the assurance that I can call the department any day or night if anything seems amiss. Thank you especially for beginning our conversation with, I am worried about you, rather than what the devil were you doing? <laughs> Not that you would say that, but <laughs> you get the point. And such small touches of kindness keep me going for another day. Um, we're, we're, we're doing well, officers. The, the morale is up. Um, I'm hearing great things from the community. We just have to you know, one interaction at a time. Chief, are you not going to be out of the office this week? Oh, thanks, Patty. I am leaving Friday after lunch, so I'll be here for uh, first day of school. We're going to have a canopy up and some stickers and some fun stuff. But then I'm leaving, and I'll be back on the sixth, um, moving my daughter to col or from college to Houston. I know. Uh, blubbering on about that. <laughs> so, are you going to have the call nine one one stickers? Is that what you're giving out? So. <laughs> okay, hold on. <laughs> Did, yeah, you hear, did you hear about that? Maybe we need a talk. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everybody. I really appreciate the Thanks. support. Thanks. Thanks, Judy. Uh, just, it's been very busy. Planning Commission has been working very diligently, as you can certainly tell. Um, we ask a huge amount of our volunteers. Planning Commission members exemplify that dedication to the village and their willingness to serve. And we now have an open seat on Planning Commission. I'll be advertising that in the YS News. So tell your friends, tell your enemies. Who's stepping off? Uh, Adam Abraham. Oh, oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, Board and Commission reports. Jerry. Oh, uh, for planning, uh, I, I have a nomination I'd like to make since uh, Adam is uh, stepping off. Um, well, you know what? We had discussed that when we do this, we would have. Uh, I mean, I. I'm the backup, and mm -hmm. I thought we were going to talk about it before we made a recommendation. Oh, I thought we, I got an email from saying that we were ready, so I assumed that, because I hadn't had been attending the meetings. And, uh, but if we're just going to start uh, advertising it? Well, we can, we cannot. We had this discussion with Board of Zoning Appeals that part of the reason that uh, that alternate position position was added initially only to BZA and to Planning Commission was so that a member could be kind of groomed, prepped, and, and versed in those pretty specific talents so that they were ready to step in if a full-time position came aboard. That's been a bit uh, changed since alternates have been added to all now boards and commissions. But at, at its inception, that was part of the reason for that addition of alternates for BZN Planning Commission. So it's so, just that so what, as the backup as the backup liaison, you know, I th thought we had agreed that the process would be that, you know. Well, the, we do have a process where, where the, you're, they're supposed to be interviewed by um, the liaison and the backup. And and the, but and but it's my understanding that this is a nomination of somebody who's already right. an alternate. Yeah, yeah. yeah. she's she's, not she's been serving. Been yes. serving as the replacement for Adam. So she's already had the out. interviews. Yeah. I never interviewed her <laughs> as the alternate. Well, I don't even know who it is. Okay, then because then he hasn't finished his nomination, but you might. Well, no, I, I didn't. I didn't want to make it about the person since I don't know yeah. who it is. Yeah, let's so not. We should, um, we should do the process first. I think it's important. I thought we had agreed to that. And and we have we have interviewed alternates for full positions. At least you and I have. So. They haven't been automatic. Right. For, for normal, for regular old non-shorter required boards and commissions, that we've had this conversation previously about the slight difference in those two types of boards and commissions, but onward. Yeah. And the fact that they can't be held up for lack of quorum. I mean, we can, Right. And, and that's and why that's, we've been using the alternate ads to make sure we have quorum. Right. So she's... She's, she's been functioning. So, I mean, I we just would like to do that process. Okay, we'll, we'll hold on that then. Yeah. Jerry, is that okay? My problem is we, we only meet once a month. Okay. Well, she's, she, whoever it is, presumably are, is already filling that seat, but it's just a question of, so they can continue to do that, but we're just deciding whether to appoint them permanently, correct? Okay. 
so on. Okay, Brian. Uh, Arts and Culture Commission, um, actually, it's really just something for the agenda. I had mentioned um, the proposal for uh, bringing the Arts Council's permanent collection to uh, the Bryan Center. And um, so Nancy Mellon would like to come and present that to us at the next meeting, maybe as a short special report. Maybe. Let's talk about that when we get to agenda planning. Okay. And then um, as far as the Economic Sustainability Commission, kind of the same thing. Um, after the next meeting, the intention is to be ready for a recommendation for the revolving loan fund. Um, so I was thinking if that could go on the second meeting in September, but we can talk about that. Judith? The Energy Board did, uh, did not have a meeting this last month, but we are planning to meet with the Tree Committee. Uh, director um, about this idea of possibly having a tree planting in the spring and uh, library commission also has not met recently justice system task force we didn't meet the last month but we've been meeting very regularly and we are moving in the direction of bring, bringing a year you know the end of the first year report on you know what the committee's work has been and sort of what our plan is for the next year probably september Maybe the second week in September, maybe uh, that report would be brought to council if possible. Okay, village mediation program. I didn't attend the meeting, but I've read the notes, and I understand that the chief made a presentation at the meeting, as did uh, Jalen uh, Rowe and uh, Jessica, Jennifer Bierman about uh, restorative justice. Uh, and there is going to be a workshop in October uh, regarding that restorative justice. Also, the mediation uh, program is planning for its 30-year anniversary coming up. Um, I met with Sean Creighton today, uh, school board liaison. I, I think the main thing that the school board wants the community to understand is that they have no plan to date about building or not building or rehabbing or not rehabbing new school buildings. They are continuing to reach out to the community. They are listening. They want to hear from the community. I think there may be going to be one more meeting, but that is where they are. No decisions have been made. Um, Human Relations Commission, there were two people that came to the last meeting. Uh, one was Donna Howler talking about a mentor program. Mentor program. Um, she didn't request a grant at that point, but she probably will come back to HRC. And then people from the Zombie Walk came and were awarded uh, grant money for the Zombie Walk. The Environmental Commission, our meeting was centered on discussing the community action plan and even more specifically the difficulties in getting um, other groups and individuals to help with it. And we, and Deward, who's really the, taking the lead on that, um, and was speaking with it, uh, the Environmental Commission about are we going to just not disband the, the Climate Action Plan? Um, are we just going to look for pieces that seem like they're doable? Are we going to look at what other groups are doing and sort of say, hey, we'll support what you're doing? Um, and I do have another email from him that I haven't read because I've been gone with some additional ideas, but it's sort of up in the air right now. How, what and how to do, what to do with this climate action plan. Um, the beaver management task force, well the beavers are gone, so there's really no beavers to be managed right now, but uh, what's happening on the glass farm is that um, we are going to have a honeysuckle removal of the honeysuckle all along King Street at the glass farm. And uh, Enoch and his uh, tree guys are going to do it with some help with uh, some of our volunteers um, who will be painting the honeysuckle honeysuckle stumps. And then we're working on developing what will be on the signage for that, uh, for the glass farm uh, rest, uh, conservation area. And there will be three benches. And we're working with a local 
uh, contractor who does stonework uh, to do some stone, three stone benches. And that's my report. Cool. Uh, Green County Regional Planning, um, lots going on in Beaver Creek Township and Sugar Creek Township, lots of big subdivisions of houses. Um, Miami Township actually is passing an agritourism um, ordinance that, that basically um, uh, addresses the whole agritourism industry. Um, it limits bed and breakfast. It actually doesn't allow bed and breakfast unless it's a uh, home occupied, which is according to the state, that's the way it is in the state also. Um, I think that's about it. Um, it is kind of actually one thing, twice we, um, Green County Regional Planning, which is just an advisory group in this situation, we uh, said no to a proposal to rezone that whole kill care, all the property at kill care to be zoning, to business zoning. We said no because, and, and a lot of other people have said no. Xenia Township trustees went ahead and, and allowed them to rezone it to be zoning so they can build anything in there, practically anything in there that's allowed in their B district, mm -hmm. which is really concerning. Well, are they thinking they're going to expand the... Well, they all that they say they want to build is store and locks, um, but the B zoning will allow them to build lots of other stuff. So it's really, it's really unfortunate. MVRPC was canceled, um, and uh, the chamber, we had a great business after hours this past Thursday at Antioch College at Herndon. Um, lots of folks were there, um, and it's, there's an incredible exhibit there. It's an incredible sculpture exhibit, if anybody, it's going to be there until October. So I would encourage folks to go look at that, a uh, uh, 1954 Antioch College, 53 I think, college grad. Um, it's very kinetic, very very architectural, actually very much like some of the work that John Hudson does because some of the pieces there are models that she's done for full-size works that she's done, so it's really interesting. And then on um, September 21st, 9 o'clock in the morning, here over at A&B, we're going to have a breakfast um, meeting hosted by Reikley Insurance about business insurance. So um, looking forward to September 5th, um, we're hoping, but don't know yet, if we're going to be able to condense all of these, I would say eight of these nine ordinances related to pocket neighborhoods to one consent agenda. There is a lot of, there's a lot of legislation. We added legislation for the PD structure. We added legislation for the Tecumseh Land Trust letter and commitment um, for the green space. We added, um, we, so we go we go down here with lots of uh, lots of legislation. Um, we move the smoking limitation to this evening. Um, something I'm looking at moving forward, wondering about moving the whole tap fee discussion to the to the night that we're doing enterprise fund budget instead of. Um, I, I don't know if you want to have the discussion. I mean, you can move the discussion to the 18th maybe and because if you want to change the tap fees, you're going to have to pass legislation, so. Right, but what is, I'm assuming it's going to be that the legislation will be written for January 1. Yeah. I'm, so, so is there any, can we, well, I, can we push it off a little bit? Well, I mean, I think Melissa probably wants to know what the new tap fees are going to be for the enterprise. Mm. Funds, but I mean, we don't really have that many of them, right? Mm -mm. No. So, I mean, what does council think? I mean, so. I just, I just can't. It, I mean, we, we can. I would say you can move it to at least the 18th. I just want to be careful about making sure that it gets done before the end of the year. So, does anybody want to just move both of those forward? Okay. Both of which. Taffy. So we'll we'll move the taffy discussion to the 18th, and we'll move the legislation to the second. Okay, okay. and then. Um, are you moving smoking limitation? I, what is what do folks think? I put that on the fifth, but that's just because we that's what we said when we took it off of tonight's agenda that we were going to put it on the fifth. We don't necessarily have to. There's I'm guessing if that's that's probably something that we would look at as a January one 
So that that's an old business, are you saying, or are you wondering if the legislation's coming? Oh, the smoking limitation, we haven't even gotten to talk about it. Yeah, so. We'll so it's just again. a discussion. So is do we want to do it at the next meeting, or do we want to delay it? Are we done with the agenda? We're not done with the agenda yet. Why don't we see what else we get on there? And then we are, you're almost done. Yeah, I mean, what else is on there? Nancy I think Mellon. The, well, I was going to wonder are, if we are needed. Are coming back to the advisory, the question of the advisory? Board. Well, um, I didn't think we, I thought we decided we were going to wait and see what the, what we got from the RFPs. I thought we were kind of leaving it up to recommendations from the consultant. Did we talk about that? I thought Marianne and Judith were going to talk. Are they going to work on it? Okay, then, then definitely if that's going to be on, I think we need to take the smoking limitation off to September 18th. Yes. So what is it? What is this thing called? The Discussion. Housing Task Force proposal? Okay, so we'll add that to the fifth. Let's move the smoking to September 18th. Is there an emergency with Nancy's proposal? I wouldn't call it an emergency. So let's put that on the 18th too. So that's, what is it, the Arts Council permanent collection? Yep. So right now what we have on the 5th is a lot of legislation and the discussion on the Housing Task Force proposal. Uh, yes. And just, yeah, okay, you've got that in your agenda, so you're good. And then on the 18th, we've got TAP fee, increased discussion, general budget fund, um, and the permanent collection. And I'm sure that there will be more by the time we... Well, on smoking. And smoking limitation and revolving loan fund. Oh, you added that. Too. How much is in the revolving loan fund? Um, at least thirty thousand. And uh, the potential to get more with a USDA grant. So. Can I ask a quick question? Mm -hmm. Judith, if yeah. we, could, we can set up yeah. a, an interview time. That'd be great. Yes, Judith. With, with, um, I can't think of the first name. Chris? Chris? Is it Chris? I got you. Yeah. yeah, and then so that we can have that to the film. Okay. Okay. Yeah, okay. Busy, busy, busy. We had a day off and see what happens. Entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 This, some of this is yours.